So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Investment Forum on Energy Transition, Unlocking Opportunities at the Local Level. So before we start our session, uh, please be reminded that participants, camera and microphone are disabled upon joining the session. So a timer will be shown on the screen to prompt the speakers of the time allocation. And this will ensure that each panel session will be kept within the allocated time. Lastly, our participants are encouraged to put their questions in the chat box, which will be read during the Q&A sessions. So to officially start our session, may I call on Her Majesty's Ambassador, Ambassador Daniel Cruz, for his opening remarks. The floor is yours, Ambassador. And uh, thank you very much, Paula. It's a great pleasure to be able to join you in these discussions this afternoon and get the Investment Forum on Energy Transition underway. Uh, a great event, which I'm delighted the Embassy has been able to prepare with the partnership of the Department of Finance, Department of Energy, the Central Bank of the Philippines, the Security and Exchange Commission, and the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines. I'm extremely happy that the discussions today will provide a platform for local government units to discuss with policymakers, renewable developers, and financial institutions, solutions to assist the local economy bounce back from the pandemic in a sustainable manner. Of course, the power sector currently accounts for a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. And experts need to say, say that we need to quadruple the pace of the global energy transition over this decade if we are to meet the commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement of keeping the global mean temperature rise well below two degrees and strive to limit the rise to 1.5 degrees. And as we move closer to COP26, which the UK will be hosting in Glasgow in November, we continue to urge all partners to scale up climate action to curb emissions. The UK is, is doing its bit and is trying to lead by example. In 2019, uh, we passed into law a net zero target, 2050. And last December, Prime Minister Johnson announced uh, the UK's new aim to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This sets the UK on the path to genuinely reaching net zero by 2050, consistent with our plans to mobilise £12 billion of government investment and potentially three times as much from the private sector to create and support up to a quarter of a million new green jobs in the UK. Of course, while we welcome uh, the progress in the use of cleaner energy around the world, there still remains an urgent need to accelerate efforts to arrest the devastating climate change impacts that we continue to witness today. Studies have already established that shifting to clean and renewable technologies such as wind and solar make more sense as these innovations are clean and have become more widely available and more cost effective. Across Southeast Asia, including in the Philippines, renewable energy is increasingly cost competitive with fossil fuels and has the potential to meet growing energy demand at a lower cost than coal power. Countries which build new coal plants now risk locking in higher costs and higher emissions for decades to come. Instead, by prioritizing renewable energy development, they would be increasing jobs in the sector to 42 million globally by 2050, four times more than the levels today. I would like to commend the Philippines for taking major steps towards decarbonization and aiming for more ambitious climate action. The United Kingdom very much welcomed the Department of Energy's announcement of a moratorium on new coal power plants last October. And we also congratulate the Philippines for the submission of an enhanced nationally determined contribution in April, which included energy amongst its key sectors. With coordinated actions, the Philippines can develop a longer term strategy towards net zero and join its regional neighbors that have already begun to rally behind this goal. So in closing, just let me say that I'm confident today's discussion, particularly on policy reforms and investment opportunities 
will inform the COP26 Energy Transition Council process, in which the Philippines is already actively engaged. It will provide better understanding on how local government units, policymakers, energy experts, and financial institutions can work together to chart the pathway to a cleaner, more resilient, and sustainable future. So I wish you all a rewarding time this afternoon. Thank you very much for an opportunity to say a few words now. Maraming salama. Thank you. Thank you very much for those encouraging opening remarks, Ambassador Cruz. Uh, now may we call on Senior uh, Undersecretary Jesus Cristino Posadas from the Department of Energy to give the Secretary's opening remarks. Yusek, uh, Jess, the floor is yours. Your Excellency Daniel Cruz, British Ambassador to the Philippines, Department of Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez, Banco Central ng Pilipinas Governor Benjamin Diokno, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good afternoon from the Philippines. Firstly, allow me on behalf of Secretary Alfonso G. Cusi to express our sincerest appreciation to the organizers of this investment forum which aims to provide a platform for open discussion with policymakers, investors, project developers, and local chief executives to understand and find solutions to the bottlenecks and stumbling blocks that hinder the implementation of energy projects, including renewable energy and energy efficiency. There is indeed an important forum as the glo global trend is now anchored towards energy transition that showcases a secure, reliable, sustainable, resilient, affordable, and clean energy future. It will serve as an avenue for our distinguished participants to share views and experiences on energy transition in a dynamic and interactive setting. We believe that the Department of Energy, together with our attached agencies, other related government-owned and con uh, controlled corporations, and other national government offices, have a collective role to play in achieving a low, low carbon sustainable energy system of the country. We, however, wish to emphasize that the national government cannot do it alone and we must always consider the important role of the local government units in the whole energy transition process and execution. This we have always recognized in the Department of Energy. Currently, the Department of Energy is implementing various programs and projects with various LGUs, including the APEC Low Carbon Model Town Project for the feasibility studies of Mandawe and its neighboring cities and Davao City. We are also a member of the Makati City Environmental Protection Council, and in partnership with various LGUs, we launched the e-vehicles performance testing program we also regularly conduct IEC campaigns on energy efficiency. And as a member of the NDRRMC, we continue to be an active partner in the rehabilitation of Marawi, as well as other areas devastated by natural calamities. As a member of the multi-partite monitoring team, we are partners with the LGUs in monitoring the environmental management and environmental compliance of energy projects. The Senate Committee on Energy provided the, DO, the DOE with 200 million pesos allocation for the development of an energy transition plan. The project is considering the development of the curriculum and materials for the different levels of the academic, academic sector, the DepEd, the TESTA, and CHED, to promote knowledge on energy and the development of appropriate energy technologies for off-grid schools and health facilities including the application of net zero technology for state universities. Under the clean energy scenario envisioned under the Philippine Energy Plan, coal and oil shares will continue to decrease due to the use of alternative fuels for power generation and transport, among others. We expect the power generation mix will shift from being coal-centered to a scenario where renewable energy natural gas and other emerging clean energy technologies were increased to provide for more than 66% of the total generation by 2040. The DOE envisions to achieve a low carbon pathway through our strong commitment, commitment 
to implement RA 9513 or the Philippine Renewable Energy Law and Republic Act 11285 or the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Law. The envisioned future is where clean and indigenous energy production paves the way for social economic recovery and progress and where energy efficiency and conservation has been fully transformed into a national way of life. We see the program as a major driver towards achieving greenhouse gas emissions avoidance and mitigation. The assessment and development of our baseline and key indicators, as well as sectoral and technology-based monitoring, reporting and verification system will be established with the full implementation of the EANC law. We firmly commit to the full implementation of Republic Act 9513 or the Philippine Renewable Energy Law. Sustainable financing solutions, innovative financing mechanisms will be encouraged to maximize the utilization of RE, both on grid and off-grid energy storage solutions and grid modernization. Other clean and emerging, emerging energy technologies like hydrogen are also being considered for enhanced reliability while working for diversification of electricity supply. The expanded use of flexible power generation and energy storage technologies to complement variable RE projects and, and support increased penetration, electric vehicles in the transport sector will push our efforts towards energy transition. Another policy initiative that we have issued and has been loaded by some ETC countries and institutions is the moratorium on the endorsement of new greenfield coal fired power plants to shift towards more flexible energy sources, reduce the energy sector's carbon footprint, and halt the installation of additional baseload coal power plants that could later become stranded assets. We need to be able to meet the country's evolving energy demand with economic, economical, efficient, and competitive energy supply that is supported by resilient infrastructures and sustainable financing. It is also imperative to note that while our country is not a significant instigator of climate change, we continue to suffer the many impacts of climate change. This is the very reason why we have always been calling for climate justice. The energy sector is not spared from the impacts of climate change. Well, it is one of the main sectors that bears the brunt of its impacts. Thus, we need to be able to, pre to prevent or at least mitigate our damage and loss if it cannot be fully prevented. Further, our pursuit of the energy sector nationally determined contribution is anchored on realizing energy security, reliability, accessibility and affordability and it is implement and its implementation should not result in any additional burden i.e increased energy prices to our countrymen it is on this note that we welcome this kind of investment forum that is aimed at attracting investments for energy transition where we can identify and deliver concrete actions to accomplish our common goals Again, let me thank our partners for hosting this forum with the Department of Energy. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you, Yusik Jess, for that very comprehensive opening remarks and updates and overview of what the Department of Energy has been implementing and is about to implement. Now let us hear the recorded messages from Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez III and Governor Benjamin Jocno of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. His Excellency Daniel Cruz, Ambassador of the United Kingdom to the Philippines, Governor Benjamin Jocno of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, fellow workers in government, distinguished guests, good afternoon. First of all, I thank the Embassy of the United Kingdom for organizing this investment forum on energy transition. This is an important event. All of our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and prevent global warming ultimately boil down to our ability to devise financing mechanisms that will enable energy transition. We are well aware of the United Kingdom's commitment to achieving a low-carbon economy. 
Through this forum, we look forward to learning from the country's experience and possibly attract investments to support the Philippines' energy transition efforts. The Philippines contributes only three-tenths of 1% of the total global carbon emissions. But as an archipelago sitting at the juncture of the Pacific Ring of Fire and the Typhoon Belt, we are among the most vulnerable to rising sea levels and extreme weather events. To challenge our own governance institutions and signify to the international community the seriousness of global warming, the Philippines submitted its ambitious, nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement last month. We have committed to a 75% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. To meet this goal, we have to undertake comprehensive policy changes, strengthen our regulatory capacity, and encourage our local governments to be more involved in the forthcoming energy transition. The Department of Finance plays a lead role in mobilizing financing for climate change adaptation and mitigation initiatives. We are currently establishing a sustainable finance ecosystem to synergize investments from both the public and private sectors. We are looking forward to yielding very soon green projects that will have a lasting and permanent impact on the world's environment and on our people. We are likewise building the capacity of our local governments for the formulation and implementation of sustainable development projects. We expect to deepen our financial markets to enable green financing to flourish. We especially thank the government of the United Kingdom for making available to the Philippines a grant that would help us facilitate green finance and energy efficiency. We have a unique opportunity in the island of Mindanao to demonstrate our carbon reduction commitments. The Philippine government is currently exploring a financing mechanism to enable us to improve the generating capacity of the Agus Pulangi hydropower plant. At the same time, we are studying a plan to acquire all coal-fired power plants in the region in order to repurpose them. This will shift most of our energy requirements in Mindanao to hydropower. There will soon be a numerous investment opportunities engaged in renewable energy in the region. Mindanao will be our showcase for a pilot of an earth-friendly future that can be replicated in other provinces. We believe that every individual needs to play a part in an all-hands-on-deck approach in this battle against climate change. Hence, we are also working on the passage of a bill that will ban single-use plastics. This is our concrete approach to encourage every Filipino to do his or her part on a daily basis in helping save the world's environment. We are continuously conducting consultations through the Climate Change Commission with civil society organizations and the private sector regarding alternatives to plastics and how we can come up with a roadmap that is at par with the international best practices and standards. We look forward to more collaboration with our international partners and the private sector to achieve our climate ambition. I hope to see many of you in the future participating in the investment opportunities opened by the Philippines Energy Transition and other climate change initiatives. Thank you.
in the same light, the BSP joined the Green Force to support the creation of a harmonized and cohesive plan in mainstreaming green and sustainable finance in the country. Last March 15, 2021, the Philippine financial sector regulators and authorities led by the DOF signed a memorandum of understanding with the British Embassy to collaborate on the implementation of proposed interventions under the United Kingdom Prosperity Fund's ASEAN Economic Reform Program and the ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Program. Respectively, these programs aim to promote economic and sustainable development, as well as improve energy security and access to clean energy in the country. The program likewise supports the Green Force initiatives in building capacity of relevant government agencies and industry players with regard to sustainable finance implementation and in crafting a sustainable finance roadmap and principles-based taxonomy. The development of the taxonomy is a key initiative aimed at providing guidance on identifying economic activities that contribute to sustainable development with special focus on addressing climate change impact. Central to the climate change mitigation goal is the need to reduce greenhouse gas concentrations by shifting fossil fuels to renewable sources. We should note, however, that a successful transition is not just a matter of isolated changes in the energy sector. We must also consider the potential risk associated with this transition given the interplay among economic activities. According to some experts, and I quote, transitions are systemic in nature, characterized by co-evolution between different actors, institutions, supply and distribution chains, unquote, among others. A low carbon transition could trigger a chain reaction that might affect the performance and viability of various loan and investment portfolios, which eventually could pose risk to the stability of the financial system and to the real economy. In this light, a progressive approach to transition must be considered without compromising environmental sustainability. The finalization of the principles-based taxonomy will play a critical part here, particularly in opening the door for the inflows of capital to relevant economic activities. The DSP Sustainable Finance Framework, which was released in April 2020, encourages the offering of green and sustainable finance instruments to support such economic activities. But at the same time, the framework safeguards the stability of the financial system against potentially significant and protracted impact of climate change and other environment-related risk. Leveraging on good governance and effective risk management systems, the framework also expects banks to embrace sustainability principles and take strategic, concrete, and progressive actions in response to the climate call. The BSP will be issuing this in second phase regulations to enable the banking industry to make safe and sound response to risk arising from the transition to low carbon economy. These supplementary issuances will provide granular expectations on the integration of climate change and other environmental and social risk in banks' credit and operational risk management frameworks. Banks may gradually consider the future implications of stranded asset risk in their credit portfolio. No doubt, the energy transition is a complex issue and comes with both risk and opportunities. 
We are, however, fortunate to have a remarkable set of expert panelists who are at the front lines of energy transition to provide us with the insights on the opportunities, challenges, and potential solutions to accelerate renewable energy and energy efficiency in the country, including financing thereof. On this note, allow me to end this remark by wishing you a successful and meaningful conversation. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, uh, Governor Benjamin Jokno and Secretary Dominguez. Uh, now, uh, last but not the least, we will have uh, Governor Dakila Kua uh, to have his opening remarks as well on behalf of the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines. Thank you. Um, Her Majesty's Ambassador Daniel Cruz, uh, Her Majesty's Top 26 Regional Ambassador Ken O'Flaherty, Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez, Energy Secretary Alfonso Cusi, Central Bank Governor Benjamin Jokno, my colleagues in the National Executive Board of the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines, or ULAP, uh, Governor Susan Yap, Mayor Noel Rosal, Mayor Luis Chavit Simpson, and of course, Councilor Pineda, and other members of the expert panels, my dear colleagues in local government service, other guests and participants, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines, or ULAP, I would like to thank the organizers, particularly the Department of Finance, the Department of Energy, the BSP, and the British Embassy in Manila for organizing this online event. Today's activity is intended to help local government units get out of the pandemic propelled economic slump and the approach is decidedly in favor of the strategic climate resilient pathway to economic recovery. One that targets investments that promote the desired transition to clean energy with emphasis on renewable energy and energy efficiency at the local level. It is undeniable that the pandemic has inflicted on us the most severe adverse socioeconomic impact, drained our coffers, stalled economic activities and increased poverty incidents. The challenge of reversing this debilitating situation, which unfortunately is compounded by the country's vulnerability to climate change hazards, compels us LGUs or local officials to opt for the green approach. One that generates jobs and revenues, but increases resilience to environmental shocks for the economy, the community and the economy ecosystem at the same time. As the representative of the comb combined forces of the subnational government, I wish to inform everyone in this forum that the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines and its member leagues are one with you in the effort to assist LGUs in pursuing alternative development approaches. In looking far beyond our horizons and in incorporating sustainability principles that LGUs may adopt, into our local recovery strategies and plans. Through our ULAP dialogue series with development partners, we have been exploring climate resilient pathways to economic growth and inclusive development through the introduction of modern technology and innovative solutions to reduce carbon emission in our own effort of enhancing local capacity despite the pandemic in order to bounce back better without the burden or guilt of not doing enough for our constituents' aspirations and the future of our children. I encourage our local chief executives to take advantage of the support that are available at this time of adversity in order to convert the current crisis into an opportunity to ramp up a campaign to attain higher economic targets while consciously avoiding, if not undoing the mistakes of the past, while at the same time, taking affirmative action for transparency, accountability, people-centeredness, and environment responsiveness. I would likewise also challenge the local legislators or the members of the local Sangunian to draw up the appropriate ordinances and policy that may pave for a more conducive business climate for all investors and give the LGUs a 
good fighting chance to lift the economic life, especially at the countryside. I am talking here of enticing the movement of capital for solar farms, onshore or offshore wind farms, and storage facilities for newer, for renewable energy. Not only will this deliberate effort enable us to combat the effects of climate change in general, but in the inter immediate to medium term, establish local capacity to meet the power demand by potential investors and end user constituents alike. Along with the implementation of the Supreme Court decision on the Mandanas Garcia cases, which will afford us LGUs wider fiscal elbow room, a collective movement to clean energy will not only infuse the local economy with new opportunities to create new industries and more jobs, which translate, by the way, to new revenue sources and increased household income. But more importantly, this green economic route will allow us the opportunity to clean the air that we breathe and protect the earth for the sake of our future generations. And for all of us, even as we recognize the leading efforts to mobilize green investments, may we local government officials find a deeper resolve and greater determination to seize every opportunity to become enablers for a gradual shift to sustainable and environment friendly practices under a new normal. I'm happy that the organizers have given the leaders of the various member leagues of the ULAP the opportunity to articulate the response of the provinces, cities, municipalities, and barangays to the challenge at hand. Muli, welcome po sa lahat ng kasama natin sa araw na ito. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po tayo. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Daxkua, for that very encouraging message and for laying the theme of our discussions for today. So this afternoon, there will be four segments of panel discussions. And the first panel will be on the implementation of energy transition policies. The second panel will be about in the, the enabling environment to attract project developers and investors. Panel three will be about energy efficiency and the opportunities and roles of the local government. And finally, panel four will be accelerating financing for the energy transition. So each panel session will be allocated 30 minutes, which will be followed by a 10 minutes Q&A session to encourage audience participation. So to start our first session, let us welcome Attorney Mona Lisa C. De Malanta, who will lead panel one on enabling environment to attract project developers and investors. Attorney Di Malanta is a senior partner at PJS Law and former chairperson of the National Renewable Energy Board or NREP. Uh, the floor is yours, Attorney Di Malanta. Thank you, Asek Paula. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Magandang hapon po sa lahat ng mga kasama natin ngayon. Um, I won't be greeting each one anymore uh, individually so that we can uh, dive deep into the conversation, this very important conversation this afternoon. To set the scene for um, for the first panel, which is uh, setting out the energy transition policy in the Philippines, we are honored to be joined by uh, DOE Undersecretary Felix William B. Fuentebella, uh, Yusek Wimpy, as we as we call him, um, oversees the Energy Policy and Planning Bureau and uh, of the Department of Energy, and also the spokesperson of the Department of Energy. So, without further delay, um, can we invite uh, Sec uh, Yusek Yusek Wimpy to provide us with the energy transition policy overview for the Philippines? Yusek Wimpy. Yusek? Attorney Wana, the team is already putting up the presentation okay. of Yusek Wimpy. All right. Maybe while we wait for Yusek Wimpy um, to prepare us also for the conversation after the, the scene setting, we are very honored to have uh, a distinguished panel of reactors from the local government units. And I was looking at the roster, and I think we're very lucky this afternoon to have them because I, when I look at the 
the respective LGUs that they represent. These are LGUs that are currently hosting renewable energy projects from solar farms to geothermal farms and even to biomass projects. So I'm, I'm actually very excited to learn from them also from their success stories of, of the projects that are located now or hosted now in their respective um, in their respective local governments. Maybe I'll do the introductions while we wait for the while we wait for the presentation to be provided. Oh, okay, now it's ready. All right, thank you. Thank you for joining us in this forum. I am Undersecretary with Defante Pelia from the Philippine Department of Energy. Next slide, please. We're here to discuss the role of the local government and in the pursuance of the clean energy scenario as provided for by the Philippine Energy Plan. Next slide, please. So we're here to discuss the Philippine Energy Plan, the clean energy scenario, and the role of the LGUs. And what we have on the screen is a Sankey diagram of the energy flow. This is a snapshot of the 2018 um, data where you can see on the left side, we have sources from oil, coal, and nat gas. And at the bottom, the green part are the renewable energy sources. It flows from the left to the right side towards the energy consumers. And we emphasize the need for energy efficiency on the part of the consumers. Next slide, please. So based on the Philippine Energy Plan, we go to the clean energy scenario. And the PAP uses the assumptions on the NEDA, PSA, and the oil prices of the OPEC. We also have the other plans and the, the clean energy scenario builds on the business as usual. Business as usual meaning if we don't do anything, um, the outcome will be more or less the same. Whereas when we introduce renewables, um, shift uh, to alternate alternative transport or the use of nat gas and then uh, introduce also energy efficiency, we pursue the clean energy scenario. Next slide, please. So the energy demand um, basically provides um, the, the clean energy scenario and we see that um, the energy supply or the oil and the coal will have to be decreased while the use of renewable energy will have to, to be increased. Next slide, please. We also expect the, trans, uh, the transformation of these uh, energy sources to be more efficient. So on the left side, you have the business as usual. And on the right side, if we are successful, we have the clean energy scenario where we have smaller utilization of oil and coal and higher use of renewable energy. Next slide, please. So this is how we compute the 2020 to 2040 greenhouse gas emission. And what we can see from here is that from 2020 to 2030, the total greenhouse gas emission will be reduced by 2.8%. And by 2040, it will be reduced by 12.3%. Next slide. So next slide. These are the programs that we have for the clean energy scenario. You have the savings, you have the assessment of the baseline, you have 1,200 1, megawatts from emerging technologies and the others. Next slide, please. We also have the implementation of the use of information communication technology, smart grid, and even uh, energy resiliency. Next slide. So, from there, we jump to the DILG DOE Joint Memorandum Circular because many of us are asking, what is the role of the local government units? The answer is big role. Next slide, please. This, uh, this stands for the guidelines of the LGUs. Uh, we teach the LGU to integrate all their plans with that of the National Plan on Energy Safety Practices, on Energy Efficiency and Conservation, on Energy Resiliency, and total energy planning. Next slide. The LGU Energy Code aims to harmonize all the reform, uh, uh, the reforming laws, um, which uh, includes the EVOS Act, the Ease of Doing Business Act, EO30, and Administrative Order Number 23, to come up with a unified and streamlined permitting process of all energy applications. Next slide, please. 
So why do we do this? Because you want to maximize the benefits for the LGUs, which includes more scholarship programs, more programs for the environment, for health, more electrification, and more um, economic development for the local uh, government units. Next slide. The LGU Energy Code finds its basis on the local government laws, the energy-related laws from energy resources to transformation to its delivery to the consumers. We also have the private sector participation and the reform laws, the regulatory reform, which includes, again, the Energy Virtual One-Stop Shop Act or the ECOS law, and even the Ease of Doing Business Act. Next slide. So we emphasize the EBOS, the Ease of Doing Business, and we also have EO30 and Administrative Order Number 23 issued by the President. So with that, we can have a more harmonious um, implementation of all these regulatory reform laws. Next slide. In reading the, all these laws, the LGUs will need to activate the energy sector committee, the energy sector committee within the local development council, so that they can implement the joint memorandum circular properly. Next slide. The energy sector committee will teach the Sangunians, the vice uh, mayors, governors, and even the governors, mayors, and the barangay captains in uh, placing the energy facilities and the energy sources in the spatial plan. So we have the space plan, which includes oil, um, coal, gas, oil, and renewable energy sources within their jurisdiction. And then we also have to put in the existing facilities, the power plants, the gasolinahan, and all the LPG refilling stations uh, within the, the LGU. And we also have to coordinate with the private uh, stakeholders, private sector stakeholders, so that if they will have to expand, the LGU should know about it in the spatial plan. Next slide. All these spatial plans are collated in the provincial and regional offices, and even in the national office, the DILG Bureau, Bureau of Local Government Development, and the DOE Investment Promotion Office will have to have a copy of this um, spatial plan so that the investors will know where to place in the investments. We also coordinate with the PPP Center. Next slide, please. From the spatial plan, we have the development plan. The development plan talks about how much, and it is a yearly activity wherein if you have a power plant, you have earnings. The, the local government units will have a share in the energy regulations 1-94. They can also have a share in the national wealth tax for other energy projects. And the local development plans include the Philippine energy policies, plans and programs that uh, embraces safety, energy efficiency, conservation, and other uh, energy plans, including energy resiliency. And all these will have to be submitted to the Regional Development Council. Next slide, please. So from the spatial plan and the development plan, we now talk about the processing of the permits. And the energy regulatory reforms provides in the EOS law to have a unified, streamlined, transparent permitting process. This process should be done within a prescribed time. If, it's not, if it is not done within the time frame, it will be deemed approved. And these are all very important that the LGU should designate the focal person to run the energy virtual one-stop shop um, system. Next slide, please. So the time frame talks about 15 calendar days if the document submitted by the energy proponent or the energy application is already complete. 15 calendar days means all the days in the calendar, including the holidays. Next slide, please. It also provides that the regional offices should, should report quarterly to the, um, to the DOE and the DILG Central on the compliance of the LGUs. Why? Why is this important? Because there are penalties. Penalties for non-compliance um, with the EWAS law. So you have strike one, two, and three. Strike one, 30 day suspension. Strike two, three month suspension. And strike three, dismissal and perpetual disqualification. 
for the following offenses. Number one, willful refusal to participate in the EBOS. Number two, delay in the operationalization of the EBOS. And number three, failure to comply with the mandated time frame. But if you notice from the, in, uh, in rule number three, if you fail to operate within the time frame, the first offense includes the mandatory attendance to the values orientation program. For offenses number four and five, which includes tampering of the EVOS or any component thereof or divulging confidential information, it's immediately dismissal and perpetual disqualification. Next slide, please. So we don't want to focus on the penalties. What we want to focus on is how the LGUs will benefit and how the consumers will also benefit. And the consumer participation is also within the policy content of the LGU Energy Code. Why? To achieve the clean energy scenario, we need the consumer's participation. Participation in energy safety practices, participation in energy efficiency, resiliency, and even the planning process. And we have to get the consumer's inputs in all the energy investment models. Next slide, please. So we have a sample um, ordinance within the Joint Memorandum Circular that was signed by Secretary Cusi and Secretary Año. And the JMC 2020-01 uh, provides for this ordinance that can be copied by the local government units. Next slide, please. So um, the LGUs have a very big role in the clean energy scenario. And if you have further queries, uh, please contact uh, the Bureau of Local Government Development of the TALG or the Investment Promotion Office of the Department of Energy because we believe that the LGUs are key in achieving the clean energy scenario. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you, Yusek Wimpi. Um, and I think at this point, um, at this point of, the, of our conversation, I will have to ask the reactors to join us in the panel by turning on their cameras. I think Yusek Wimpi is also with us. So um, Yusek can be invited also to turn on your camera so we can start the conversation. Um, first among the reactors is um, Governor Susan Yap of Tarlac, of the province of Tarlac. Governor Susan Yap is the currently the Executive Vice President of the League of Provinces of the Philippines. Magandang hapon po, uh, Governor. We're also joined by Mayor Noel Rosal of Legazpi City. Uh, mayor is currently the focal mayor for environment, climate change, and disaster risk reduction and management of the League of Cities of the Philippines. We're also joined this afternoon um, representing Mayor Luis Chavez Singson of the League of Municipalities of the Philippines. We have Executive Director E.D. Andrea Loriaga. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, and then finally, representing Councillor Eden Pineda of Tacloban City, who is the president of the Liga ng Mga Barangay, is, our, is the Executive Director of the Liga ng Mga Barangay, um, Director Luki Avila Fanlo. Andang hap sa kanilang lahat. So um, may I invite the or the reactors to turn on your camera. Um, maybe the first question I would have, and I'm really excited to hear your thoughts about this because I, as I mentioned earlier, um, the roster of local governments that we have this afternoon are actually hosts to um, renewable energy projects in their provinces, um, mainly in the provinces because sometimes they, the projects traverse municipalities or barangays. But maybe what we would love to hear from, maybe we can start with Governor, uh, Governor Yap is, um, what are the benefits that the local government has realized from, from having or from hosting renewable energy projects in, in your respective jurisdictions, ma'am? Ma'am, I think we're, we're on mute still. There. Apo. Thank you. Um, thank you, Attorney Mona Lisa. And um, of course, thank you, Undersecretary of Quintabella, for that very informative presentation on the role of local government units in achieving the clean energy scenario. We appreciate the figures presented and the brief overview and field in energy plan and where we stand at present. It is particularly inter interesting that renewable energy is gaining ground as a preferred source of energy used by the general public. Ang Tarlac po ay isang, uh, we host several solar plants um, here in the province. 
Um, as to your question, Attorney Mona Lisa, whether what is the benefit to us? The benefits, number one, of course, uh, clean air. No? But um, right now, uh, it is not, we are still not very well versed on the technical aspects and the, um, the benefits no, for the local government units. Uh, I believe that the right now the global pandemic and its grave economic consequences provides us a perfect opportunity to build more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient societies. Uh, this opportunity is likewise present in the energy sector, where the Philippines is in a unique position to develop, to develop considering its vast renewable energy sources. Tarlac being um, considered as one of the having the best sun radiance in the country, um, I think that's why we're very attractive to uh, solar companies. No? Um, the government and its resources alone are not sufficient to maximize the country's uh, potential in harnessing our renewable, renewable energy sources. That's why we rely heavily on um, private participation, the private sector participation. Through the investors' capital, we are hopeful that it will accelerate the country's transition to clean energy. Not only is this for the environment, but more importantly, we are aware of that renewable energy, oil and coal, is um, limited. Sooner or later, of course, this will be a problem, and the cost of producing uh, energy via the old methods, via the old um, system is going to be uh, very cumbersome. Uh, the presentation by uh, Undersecretary Pentabella revealed how, how <clears throat> that the public sector or the private sector cannot do it on its own. It's, each is needed to work together to maximize our country's renewable potential uh, <clears throat> and unlock the opportunities in the Philippines. No? Um, the grid, because the position, uh, I've talked to several solar companies that have uh, located in the province. Uh, the challenges are the post locations being near to the grid and uh, everything. Um, and sometimes there is resistance by the uh, local, what do you call this, utility companies, the uh, distributors here, because they've already purchased their um, energy powers in the coming years, no? For they've already purchased five years in the from the grid. Kaya kuminsan may konti pang resistance with our Tarelco or our local distributors here. However, I think they've already accepted um, slowly to um, to accept more um, renewable energy resources like solar. A lot of the houses, farmings, um, our big farming and agricultural uh, industries here in the province have already tapped using um, uh, solar. No? So uh, these are the things we still need. If there will be more training and fora that um, the local government units, um, that the DOE or uh, <clears throat> and the Department of Finance can have in the future, we would like this very much no? so that we can cascade the information down to our um, local chief executives, our mayors and city uh, mayors. No? So, Attorney uh, Lisa, uh, that's all. And thank you to everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm sure you said we be taking notes as well. But you yes. check before I get back. Before I get back to you. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll ask uh, Mayor, um, Mayor Rosal also for his for his input so that maybe you said you can address each point um, as, as we accumulate them. Thank you. Uh, Mayor? Good afternoon. A pleasant afternoon to my fellow speakers in this event, Her Majesty's Ambassador Daniel Cruz of uh, the British Embassy Manila, Secretary Carlos Dominguez of the Department of Finance, Governor Benjamin Jokno of the Banco Central of the Philippines, Governor Dax Gua, President of the ULAP, and uh, our distinguished officials from the national government and local government leagues. I am here today on behalf of our national president, Bacolod City Mayor Ping Leonardia. Today, our investment forum is very timely 
in discussing potential collaborations between local governments, the national government, and the private sector to accelerate the shift to renewable energy through the energy transition plan. Hearing a while ago, attorney, the presentation of DOT of the Department of Energy really showcases the role and the crucial role of local government, especially the partnership between DILG through Secretary uh, Año and of course, Secretary Cusi representing the Department of Energy. So this really shows that this, a potent, this is now the potential of our country and we have a lot of promise on this. The ship also aligns with our national and local commitments for sustainable investments to combat the impact of climate change while addressing the rising demand for electricity from the public. Recently, as we all know, attorney, as mentioned by Secretary Dominguez, that Bicol is one of those targeted by his statement of the Pacific Ring of Fire. We are visited by about 10 to 12 typhoons per year. We Bicolanos again felt the brunt of our country's energy limitations when we suffered a widespread power outage due to the damage caused by typhoons late last year on the transmission lines of the National Grid Corporation. City governments have been at the forefront of innovative measures to boost renewable energy investments. Of course, through political leadership, sustained investments and responsive projects and policies. In my city, being the center of the province of Albay, Legazpi City, we are committed to pursuing sustainable low emission development through smart growth and renewable energy use. We, in the partnership with the USAID. Several cities from our league, the League of Cities of the Philippines to in, inform everyone, show interest toward a more sustainable pathway. For instance, I would like to cite our members, La Carlota City installed solar panels in all public buildings. San Carlos City and Dipolog City vowed to increase the share of renewable energy for all their LGU operations by 2022. Cities also demonstrated the potential of renewable energy in local revenue generations. As evidenced by the 45 million worth of annual revenues in Cadiz City through their solar energy project. But we, all, we also recognize that renewable energy may be an expensive and unreliable option given the erratic weather patterns in the country. We are no, we're aware of all of that. We need cheap and reliable sources of power that will meet the growing demand of the public. To this end, local governments needs to work closely with the national government and the private sector to determine solutions for sustainably generating electricity through renewable energy sources without adding financial burdens to the consumers. Our country's power grid, as we all know, also, we're still on a one grid policy attorney and we're still committed to that being so we have the, the pseudo, we call it the, the, the local cooperatives. But to tell, I tell you everyone, we have innovated in Albay, the PSP, as we call it, almost four years ago, the private sector participation to improve the efficiency of the services. Power grid may not be suited yet to handle a high renewable energy load. We may need to establish more independent power grids for the provinces and regions regions to use the energy for a more efficient energy supply. For instance, as we all know, Bico region is very rich for geothermal plants. We have two right now, Tiwi and the Bakman Manito, which covers almost the entire Southern Luzon. However, the high voltage electricity travels to the NGCP station in Tayabas, Quezon, then return to Bicol at a lower power voltage. This is the big issue now. We acknowledge the concerns raised by the private sector in setting up renewable energy projects about the lengthy permitting process due to signatures needed at various level. Local governments can help by simplifying the requirements. We have now the ease of doing business. And I tell you, 
a gas city and major cities are one of those very supportive and really now almost major cities in Metro Manila are doing this. Following the ease of doing business law, strong partnership between public and private stakeholders are critical in spurring sustained investments and building an enabling environment for renewable energy. So again, as we move towards the better normal, it is high time that we focus on the efficient implementation of the Philippine Energy, energy Transition Plan. Rest assured, in behalf of our president, that the league will continue to be a reliable partner in the laudable endeavor. Together, we will bolster the Philippine world-class reputation as a pioneer in renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Rosal, uh, for highlighting the challenges as well as uh, the benefits because, um, as you mentioned, the Bicol region has been host to these uh even the renewable energy act so very very rich in learnings for for the region um i know we are quite uh mindful of the time but if we can have um maybe um eb loriaga if if you have a few statements or a few insights maybe a, a couple of minutes for for you to share those with us thank you good afternoon everyone um, on behalf of our national president, Mayor Luis Chavitz in Singson, let me share our thoughts. Providing electricity to our constituents, even in off-grid areas, is the primary goal of many of us. We want to provide comfortable living, even to the remotest areas. However, we also recognize that we cannot rely solely on coal plants or other traditional sources of energy. We need alternative sources, and in order to lessen our carbon footprint, renew renewable energy is the way to go. That's why there are LGUs already investing in generating solar power. Solar farms are now starting to get built, but not all LGUs can finance these ventures. Today, we are glad that the local government units are investing at the local level is the focal point of this activity. Our limited resources don't give us the luxury to innovate because we are focused on delivering the basic needs of our people. We welcome policy reforms that will, be, will enable our LGUs to venture into clean and re renewable energy. All those mentioned earlier, especially the streamlining of process and corresponding fees. We will abide by the national government's marching orders in order to maximize the benefits from energy projects. I also want to share with everyone that the League of Municipalities of the Philippines is open for collaboration on projects that will benefit our member municipalities. We are just an email or a phone call away. Hopefully, the output of this forum will give us the hope to provide better services and more active local economies for our people. Thank you for the invitation and for giving the time for us to be part of this forum. Thank you, E. Dealer. Yeah. Items on uh, the, the off-grid um, off areas in addition to what uh, was earlier said on the on the grid. And then finally, um, maybe E. D. Uh, e. D. Fanlo, a few a few minutes uh, for you to share with us your your insights um, representing the most basic unit. Uh, of our government system, which is the barangay, our frontliners in the in the government system. Idi Idi Luki Fanlo. Yes. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you to all dignitaries for giving us the ability to have interface and a forum with uh, all the British Embassy and all our respective agencies concerned with uh, energy. So, as far as the barangays are concerned. Um, we would like to bring up that barangays being the lowest of all the local government units, the best way for us to participate in renewable energy is for us to lobby or, or generate, you know, uh, improved policies on uh, micro development. For us, the best approach would be to uh, create private sector participation 
and enhance the development of micro or cooperative units. That way, it will give a chance for smaller investors to be able to pool their resources. And if there are policies that can really create a more relaxed or a, a, a better way of doing business by improving the concept of cooperative development and allowing uh, privileges uh, like uh, probably tax breaks or something that would not only encourage more economy to the lower sectors, but it allows the geography of the different barangays to be able to make better certain uh, renewable projects that are best adaptable to their specific locations. So I guess uh, the best message is that we want uh, a very close cooperative cooperation given that the barangays have a unique uh, concept of uh, being an LGU uh, resource wise. So the only way that the barangays can participate with uh, the concept of energy transition is for us to work with uh, higher agencies to be able to develop more concise micro plans for better cooperative development. And that would allow smaller scale investors to pull their resources and to be able to create cooperative plants that can feed their individual units. So this creates self-sustaining communities within certain localities that is dependent on the particular geography uh, and the particular type of renewable energy that is most adapted to them. And uh, other than that, we'd like to thank and, and like, uh, like our fellows and other leagues, we are here to greatly cooperate with all the agencies because to, to, improve, to improve this would bring better economy for all the barangays in the Philippines. That said, thank you very much, everybody. And Great afternoon. Thank you, E.D. Maraming salamat po. Um, just a reminder for our audience, our attendees, if you have questions, please write them in the chat box uh, so we can address your questions. But in the meantime, um, Lucia Quimpy, maybe we have enough for you to, to chew on and <laughs> share with us your, your insights to the, to the points raised by um, our local government officials. Salamat po. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Mona. Thank you very much no, sa ating mga LGUs, uh, especially to the team of um, Tisusan, Manoy Noel, <laughs> and to the beautiful ladies. Uh, thank you for your insights. No? Um, we have an idea of where we come in. First of all, um, I'm happy that we have Legaspi City here because Legaspi City, uh, through the leadership of Mayor Rosal, was able already to pass its ordinance on the local government uh, unit uh, LGU Energy Code. No? So, siya yung nauna. No? He was mentioning ease of doing business, but actually, it's EVOS yung basis ng ordinansa. Uh, so, congratulations, Mayor Noel, for that. No? Number two, uh, may nabanggit din na gustong kumita ng barangay. Uh, malaki po ang kikitain ng barangay, maglagay lang tayo ng planta. In fact, uh, power plant. Um, makakapagkwento dyan yung ibang barangay ng, ng Lake ng uh, Albay, no? na they're housing geothermal plants. And uh, to inform also si Governor Susan Yap, no? yung barangay na pinagtayuan ng solar uh, farm, eh, pag ito po ay nakapagbenta ng kuryente sa grid, Eh, sigurado po kikita rin yung, ano, yung barangay, yung munisipyo, at yung uh, probinsya. Dahil meron tayong tinatawag na Energy Regulation 1-94. This is a system wherein uh, the host community, barangay, uh, munisipyo, syudad, at saka probinsya, will have a share. May profit sharing scheme siya. No? So, 1 centavo per kilowatt hour sale, may May, uh, may share ang uh, host. So yung host na yon ay dire-diretso magbukas lang ng account at naguhulog na yung genkos ng pera doon. At dahil dyan, hindi lang naman kuryente yung usapin natin. So pag nagkakaroon tayo ng share doon, ayos yung daan, more scholarship, more hospitals and the like. The economy gets better. At uh, ano pa yung pwedeng itayo ng barangay na kikitain? No? Uh, yung bayad center. Kasi ang yan ang issue minsan sa Albay. No? Um, 
um, yung mababa ang collection efficiency ng ng local ng uh, distribution utility. Um, but we also want to encourage uh, the LGU level no yung may local development council to establish the energy energy sector committee. Why? Because we have to address a lot of misinformation about energy. No may sinasabi na makakatulong ba yung dalawang grid or yung yung kuryente ba na pinudo sa Albay eh ibabato muna sa Tayabas at ibabalik sa Albay. Hindi po. It doesn't happen that way. In fact, um, yung kuryente na pupudos ng geothermal plants ng Albay, ginagamit ng mga taga-Albay. Ang nagbabayad iba yung kakontrata ng no, mga geothermal plants. So, ang payment scheme ang nagkakaroon ng uh, issue sa contractual uh, obligations. Pero yung kuryenteng na produce dyan, kaya tulad nung nagkaroon tayo ng bagyo, eh, naputol yung grid. Tapos bakit meron tayong mga paraan na pwedeng ibalik yung kuryente abagad sa certain areas? It's because may planta doon. It doesn't matter kung sino yung kakontrata. Pero ang importante... Uh, makukuha mo yung kuryente. So, that's uh, do, uh, si attorney mo na nagsabi sa akin yan eh. Ang problema kasi sa energy, may science, no? Ano yung ipasok mo, yun din ang labas. So, that's the first thing that she teaches in the law school. And that is, that should be the first thing that the energy sector committee will also teach everyone in the locality. So, kikita ang barangay, uh, pwede tayong magpunta naman sa hindi kuryente, No? Um, namomonitor ba natin yung presyo ng gasolina, diesel, kerosene, LPG? Paano natin papalakihin yan? No? What is the private sector participation na pwedeng pasukan ng LGU? First advice from a personal point of view, kasi magkakaibigan naman tayo, huwag tayong papasok sa operation ng, ano, ng energy business para sa LGU. Kasi may COA. Kasi may budgeting issues. Paano pagiging private sector participation or PPP, no? public or private partnership? I would rather go for land preparation and have the land offered by LGU to a power plant or to uh, these repealing stations. Lalong lalo na sa Albay, mayroong port sa Legazpi. So paano magkaroon ng mga facilities doon na pwedeng magkaroon ng impact na mapababa yung presyo ng gasolina. So these are the items na pwedeng i-consider ng LGU. Um, okay bang magkaroon ng solar? Not all the time. For example, in the Visayas and Mindanao, ang peak, ang peak time is um, gabi. Ibig sabihin ng peak na gabi, eh, mas maraming gumagamit ng kuryente sa gabi. So saan mas bagay ang solar? Doon sa mas maraming gumagamit ng kuryente habang may araw. So, kaya mas bagay nga uh, Gov. Susan sa, sa Luzon. So, these are the things that we must consider um, by establishing the uh, Energy Sector Committee within the Local Development Council. So, um, para po magawa yan um, at mag-umpisa na yung ibang uh, tulad ng Legaspi, no, nauna na sila, mag-activate mag na tayo no, by plotting saan sa parang magpaplano tayo ng bahay. Saan dito yung kusina? Saan dito yung kwarto? Okay. Doon naman sa energy plan natin, saan yung pwedeng tayuan ng mga planta? O saan pwedeng magkuha ng resources? So, may, may basurahan ba dito na pwedeng biomass source from uh, agricultural waste? Meron ba tayong solar is everywhere? Meron ba tayong wind tunnel? No? Meron ba tayong offshore wind area? So, doon hanapin natin saan sa LGU. Kasi pag nahanap natin yun, we can invite the, the organization of energy investors. So, yun ang una, spatial plan. Tapos, uh, yung development, mapapakita na po namin. Kasi, um, kung, 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 uh, for example, 5 hectares ng solar, eh okay ba siya? Baka mahal. Baka mas maganda, 50 hectares. So, paano gagawin yun? We can guide you. So, as long, for as long as we know where it is. And the money, the development plan will come in. 
Thank you, Yusek. Um, I think we heard the the time check from our from our organizers. Hindi ko pasi alam yung time ano ko eh. Right on time. No, it's it's okay, sir. Uh, because we're we're monit the organizers are monitoring the time. But thank you for thank you for the responses. I hope um uh they were also very helpful. I would do questions, but maybe um for for another time. But maybe we can on the chat panelists because I was wondering the either the ordinances as shared by by Yusek earlier either the ordinances have already been enacted it was mentioned that Legazpi City yes. already did but um, so for the other panelists whether the ordinances have already been enacted and or um, a local renewable energy plan has already been has already been passed or the spatial plan moving up to or evolving into a development plan. Um, I don't know if uh, Gov, uh, Gov Susad or Mayor Noel would, would, want, to, would want to share uh, very quickly for, for, this, uh, for this update. Yes, Attorney. Apa. I would like to thank Yusek uh, Wimpi uh, for recognizing Ligaspi. As you all know, attorney, and uh, si Wimpy alam niyan kung gaano ka problema. Despite that we produce our own geothermal. Yan nga ang problema. Binubugbog kami dito, attorney, ng mga Bicolanos. Why not create a Bicol grid? Akala nila ganun lang kadali. Di ba, Yusek? Magawa ng Bicol grid. Akala nila ganun lang. Kaya nga, ang hirap pa. Kasi sabi na tayo ngayon may-ari niyan. Di ba? Tayo ngayon may-ari. But anyway, uh, we still are under, under the one grid policy. But, but because of this itong tiyatahak natin, itong mga bagong uh, partnership natin uh, with a new renewable energy, I think uh, we just have really to be more focused and strengthen yung mga resources ng mga local governments. And sabi ko nga, the government can only do so much in this aspect. Kailangan talaga yung partnership with the private sector. Yun talaga ang pag-asa natin. Thank you. Bob Susan, um, would you like to say anything Pop, before we address a question from the from the audience can i know what barangay yung ano or what town yung barangay para i can also relate to um to the area ed lugi ano pong barangay po ba natin Councillor Eden Pineda, who's represented by E.D. Luki, comes from Tacloban City. Um, but I don't know. Uh, ah, okay. 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 Yeah. Alam ko na. Oh, salite. Okay. Thank you. So I think um, I'll pass. I can, I can, the... I can discuss some, oh, sige some things that uh, we can trigger questions. No, I may question, sir. Actually, there's a question from the audience, okay. but I'll pass on the hosting job back to um, to Asek Paula. Thank you, Attorney Dimalanta, and uh, she passed me back the hosting because she will also be on the panel to answer some of the questions herself. So our first question is from uh, Miss Maria Mamba Hilia Flor. So this is how the this is open to anyone in the panel. Huh? Uh, so first. Transitioning to renewable energy is inevitable for sustainability. But considering current practices by power distributor, distributors, specifically the cooperatives, how will transitioning to renewable energy translate to lower power rates for the households? So that's the first question. The second question is from Mr. Ben Kritz of Manila Times. This is for DOE, but I guess other uh, panelists can also answer. So he says, I am curious whether mini or microgrid systems figure into the energy strategy. And if so, to what extent? So uh, you said Quimby, you want to go first? We'll follow with the others. Yes, Thank question you. number one. How do we balance RE and price, lower price? So please remember these three letters, no? CSP, competitive selection process. It's like bidding. So the distribution utilities are required to have a portion of their demand, 1%, uh, pwedeng tumaas pa, no? that's a minimum, 
um, to purchase their requirements from a renewable energy source. So they will have to undergo a competitive selection process. So yung CSP, tatlo. Yung una, general CSP, labo-labo yan kung kahit sinong planta, renewable or conventional, bakbakan sila. Tulad nung huling nangyari, uh, bakbakan sa Meralco, ang nanalo, not gas, at least malibis linis na, na source. The other one is uh, yung RPS CSP, no? yung Renewable Portfolio Standard o yung quota na renewable ay magkakaroon ng CSP. So I will get 2% 5 years or 10 years from RE. Magkoconduct doon ang distribution utility. Yon required kasi may quota. Yung pangatlo, yung green energy auction, kung saan si Attorney Mona was very active also no, in, in crafting all, all these policies, especially the green energy auction. So yun, a DOE ang magpapa-auction o magpa-conduct ng competitive selection process. So ano yung mga RE ulit? Big show, biomass, geothermal, solar, hydro, ocean, and wind. So that's the answer to the first question. On the second question is, Kaya ba yung mini-grid or micro-grid? Ganito yung kwento niya. No? Pag mini-grid, micro-grid, eh, ito po ay power system or uh, power plant or battery pack. No? Parang battery pack ng cellphone. So saan mo pwede siyang ikabit? Sa loob ng DU ba? Sa loob ng isang probinsya? So na doon siya tatakbo. Pwede siya. Kaya lang kailangan ng spatial plan. Yung spatial plan kasi, hinahanap mo saan yung feeder. No? Yung feeder, ano yung kakayahan niya? Yung feeder ay pagpasok ng kuryente kasi siya yung nag-distribute ng kuryente. No? Kaya nito accommodate na may papasok. Gaano kadami? So yung, yung mga tanong kung microgrid, minigrids ay pasok sa plano, it will all depend doon sa titingnan natin spatial plan. Kasi makikita natin doon, merong box doon na pumapasok yung mga kuryente. Ano yun? kaya ba niyang mag-entertain ng 30% or 40% ng RE? For example, sa bahay ko ngayon, mainit. So, uh, hmm. meron akong solar um, net metering sa bubong ko. So, ilang solar net metering sa isang subdivision ang kaya? Kasi hindi lahat pwedeng ma-accommodate ng, ng wires natin. No? Wires. So, that's just, uh, ano, that's just an input and uh, yeah, there is a microgrid bill going on in Congress with different terms, but I'll wait for the final output. But for now, ganun siya. At pati yung sa mga isla, uh, ganun din ang plano natin. Titingnan natin behavior, anong planta ang magmamatch sa kanya uh, from the biomass, uh, geothermal, solar, hydro, ocean, wind, plus battery, or do we go diesel, solar, uh, diesel, uh, coal, or whatever source to tulad ng natgas. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Yusek Wimpy. So uh, I think we're running out of time. But are, if there are any other uh, last points before we go to the next uh, panel discussion, it, uh, we open the floor. Uh, maybe Attorney Mona Lisa, you could have um, some insights, I don't know, from the private uh, perspective also before we close. Maybe just as a parting shot, just to underscore the critical role of LGUs in in all the RE programs in the energy transition plan. My my dream really when we were in the when we were in the NREB and formulating the 2020 to 2040 National Renewable Energy Program is really for the LGUs to be RE champions. There's no one who knows better the resource in their respective areas other than the LGUs themselves. And for the LGUs to be the champion or to be the, you know, the torchbearer of the respective resources located in their areas, that would, I think, be the best signal to investors, um, to attract investors to come to their, to come to their areas, because the LGUs themselves would be the ones pushing for, for the project. That's the, I think that's the dream. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, with that, uh, very good discussions. And uh, we end the first panel. So I'm sure our DOE and development partners and our LGUs have a lot of takeaways from that discussion alone. So moving on, our next panel on enabling environment to attract project developers and investors will be moderated by Ms. Kirstie Hamilton. So Kirstie is seconded 
in to advise the COP26 energy transition team and lead the work on building investment confidence under the Energy Transition Council by the Chatham House. Her work focuses on conditions to mobilize capital for international clean power scale up through investor engagement with governments. So, Kirsty, uh, if you're here, I, I yield the floor to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a, an immense pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning uh, for anyone who's uh, based in Europe. Um, to, this is the panel that's looking at investor views from banking and equity and uh, developers in what they look for when they're making investment decisions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our scene setter, Ms. Uh, Sarah Jane Ahmed. She's the finance advisor to the V20 group, which she'll explain, but she is the former, she's a, a very experienced former investment advisor and a long-term energy and investment um, expert in emerging markets. So please, uh, Sarah, please take the floor. Sarah, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi, hi, everyone. I'm just going to um, share my screen and, and then we can proceed. Okay, uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, Sarah. Okay, excellent, I'll, I'll start. Um, so good good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you to the, the UK Embassy and, and the Department of Finance um, for the invitation to be part of this conversation on investment opportunities and on the energy transition. Um, uh, so before I begin, I'd like to introduce the Climate Vulnerable Forum, the CVF and the V20, which represents 48 developing economies across Asia Pacific, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, the V20 was founded in 2015 uh, under the presidency of the Philippines two months before the Paris Agreement to translate the political agenda into real economy progress. And the V20 today under the presidency of Bangladesh have a climate prosperity agenda driven by a singular ambition to roll out early economy wide and ambitious renewable energy and resilience strategies to maximize investment and socioeconomic outcomes. So today, we know that we have the cost effective technology in the form of deflationary renewables and storage and grid upgrades to displace high emitting, volatile, expensive and economically harmful fossil fuels. Um, okay, now on to my presentation. Um, so I'd like to briefly touch on the context of Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian countries have young populations and job opportunities and cost competitiveness, especially in the power sector today do matter. Um, power tariffs are a pressure point, especially for countries that import a lot of their fuel needs. For example, the Philippines, which imports a lot of their coal and oil um, has a tariff of about 17 US cents on the main grid. Um, and it's uh, more expensive, of course, in isolated and island grids with true costs reaching almost $1.25 per kilowatt hour uh, due to import diesel dependence. Um, so we're seeing that capital markets are shifting decisively um, towards cleaner investments. Um, over 145 significant financial institutions have coal exclusion policies. Over 50 um, significant institutions um, have policies that include um, exclusion of oil and gas assets. Uh, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, um, has come up with a significant report this week um, on pathways towards safeguarding the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Agreement. Uh, key results include there is no need for new investment in new fossil fuel supply and that new investment in fossil fuel will end up str as stranded assets and the finance industry will immediately have to address their investment policies accordingly. Uh, the other key takeaway that I saw from the report was that solar and wind generation will provide about 68% of power um, in the entire globe. Um, so 
just moving on to the next slide, uh, the power planning community and, and globally significant financial institutions obviously are recognizing this arc of new technology development. This graph here is from Blue, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, specifically um, showing the pricing for, for, the, for the Philippines. So we're seeing that renewables and storage will already undermine the competitiveness and return on investment of fossil fuel assets unless they are subsidized or with automatic pass-through provisions, which ultimately leads to higher costs for consumers and industry. Um, battery cost deflation is steeper than wind and solar, um, and in some markets, battery is already cheaper than fossil gas used for peaking. So considering the deflationary trend of renewable energy uh, and storage options, uh, we have this opportunity now to design the power system that encourages the use of modernized technologies, and the Department of Energy has taken the lead already on this uh, to make way for these modernized technologies. And now it's time for the implementation side of this. Um, and so uh, an example um, of delivering uh, lower prices in the Philippines is actually the what, what could be seen as a success is the feed-in tariff, um, where, for example, uh, there was a 30% reduction in the wholesale uh, power prices uh, in the Luzon Visayas grid. So the cost avoided basically over an uh, over a one year period was over $900 million, while the cost of the feed in tariff program was $500 million. So the net impact is a savings of $400 million. Um, and this is at the time um, when uh, you know, the feed in tariff prices were, were a bit higher than, than the current renewable energy prices today. So we can see already that there are a lot of benefits to be gleaned from this transition. Um, so this is uh, just two figures to show the opportunity for optimized competitive renewable energy zones for both solar, PV, and wind. Um, and hopefully uh, there is also, well, knowing where these assets sit, um, hopefully the transmission operator or, or NGCP uh, would then build out transmission assets uh, to match uh, where these renewable energy assets sit so that the country has the opportunity to maximize such assets. Um, the graph here on the left um, right here uh, illustrates the comparative stability of offshore wind production uh, to solar and onshore wind production. So we're seeing already that offshore wind can provide steady and reliable power generation profile. Uh, and it's comparable actually to, to conventional baseload power plants yet flexible enough, of course, to track demand behavior. So the current technology uh, in wind turbines as well can provide other support to the power system, not just generation, but also um, can provide regulated feed and, and can support overall grid stability. Um, in the Philippines, we, we, is, we also have retail competition and open access, uh, and this is an opportunity for renewable energy uh, to enter where there is some level of contestability, meaning at a certain amount of, uh, of consumption, the customer would be able to buy from alternative sources, so they wouldn't have to buy from their, uh, from their distribution utility. So this opens opportunities for renewable energy generators to deliver uh, power to consumers directly. Um, just to, to show how this is already transmitting through the, um, I guess, uh, through the private sector is um, Aboitis has uh, released an annual report um, for 2020. And we're seeing here, it's written, a significant portion of the captive market may shift away from coal and other hydrocarbon fuels, which may expose coal power plants uh, of the company to stranded asset risk. Um, so what this highlights here is the interaction of renewable energy and retail competition, causing expensive fossil fuels to turn out to be stranded assets, but more importantly, highlights the investment opportunity uh, for renewable energy. Um, so another dimension of opportunity created in the energy transition beyond lower prices is strengthened employment. Um, specifically, the shift to renewable energy has higher occupational intensity numbers than imported fossil fuels. Um, 
also there is a need to be or or a need to have the ability to be proactive to current and future interests and requirements of major companies and trade partners um, as as they they shift their policies. Uh, for example, a lot of corporates now have RE100 targets or net zero commitments by 2050. There's also a pending carbon border adjustment mechanism in the EU and potentially other economies in the future. So the question for us here in the Philippines is that are major companies, major economies able to reach their low carbon or net zero targets in our country, or will they have to look elsewhere, such as Vietnam? Um, Vietnam has installed 9.3 gigawatts of solar rooftop in 2020. Uh, in 2019, uh, Vietnam only had, or sorry, in 2018, Vietnam only had 105 megawatts of solar. Um, this figure rose to five gigawatts within a one year period. And uh, in 2020, it reached 16.5 gigawatts. So the installation and speed and scale is proven and certainly feasible um, in the Philippines with a vast renewable energy endowment. Um, so for industry and especially LGUs looking to attract manufacturing capacity, cold storage and other productive opportunities, um, you know, energy efficiency is a large private sector investment opportunity. I understand there is an energy efficiency panel, so I will just gloss through this very quickly. Um, so the investment opportunity in energy efficiency is up to over 200 billion US dollars through to 2040. Um, and now just some slides on these uh, small island and isolated grid opportunities. Uh, so over half the Philippine population, more than 50 million people reside in isolated and island grids, which are served by electric cooperatives, and they rely mostly on you know, subsidized diesel power. Um, despite renewable energy viability in small island grids, the state-owned power corporation, NPC SPUG, continues to install diesel gensets, growing the subsidy requirements to reach electrification goals. Um, it usually spends about 200 million US dollars per year on fuel costs alone. Uh, for 2021, the state owned corporation NPC SPUG was aiming for a 300 million US dollar increase in the subsidy to be collected from all households. Um, so, you know, in addition to not paying tax on any of the fuel costs, uh, there is now an, uh, a request to, to more than double the budget. Um, so considering that renewable energy is less than two thirds of the cost of diesel, um, it is prudent to halt new diesel power investments immediately and accelerate hybridization with solar, biomass, wind, um, as well as the redirection of the cross subsidy. Um, I think that says my time is up. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll quickly maybe just run through the investment uh, opportunity slides just to quantify uh, what this looks like. Um, clear investment need with 29% of the population remaining unelectrified. Um, and BARM um, is especially in need with 73% of the population lacking access to power. So this represents massive investment opportunities. Um, there are many joint venture models that include uh, you know, local PPP structure. So local government units can also be involved here, uh, along with the uh, private developers, uh, electric cooperatives, and even community groups um, where, where feasible and relevant. Um, so in terms of uh, what can be done, you know, pro project aggregation at the investor level um, can be done, be done in specific uh, regions where cooperatives can band together or um, different LGUs perhaps can band together to create vehicles to, to, to engage with investors um, on electrification. Um, in terms of the total investment opportunity over the near term, this is my last slide, um, NPC SPUG, uh, diesel plants hybridization has an investment opportunity of 313 million US dollars. Um, and over the decade, so this decade, there's an opportunity for new renewable energy mini grids uh, of, of about 1.6 billion US dollars. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a really good overview spanning trains in the broader finance sector, which I know will be picked up later, as will energy efficiency, but also delving in and touching on the actual opportunities at local level. 
which is what we're going to turn to now. So let me briefly introduce the panel. Unfortunately, the intros are short as with the previous panel so that we can spend more time discussing the, the, the content and questions that come from the audience afterwards. Um, so very pleased to invite the panelists to turn on their camera. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to welcome Ms. Lynette Ortiz. She is the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank Philippines and has extensive banking experience both locally and internationally. Then we've got uh, Mr. Tony Coveney from Thomas Lloyd. He is a managing director and head of infrastructure asset management. And Thomas Lloyd, which I'm sure he'll explain, is one of the oldest and largest largest investors in renewables in the Philippines um, and did the first utility scale renewables plant back in uh, renewables uh, back in 2014. And then finally, but definitely not least, Dr. Yong Keng Jai. He is the chief of the energy sector group of the Asian Development Bank and he has over three decades of energy development experience in Asia and Africa. So great pleasure to welcome uh, the three panelists. Um, may I turn to you first, uh, Ms. Lynette Ortiz, please. Um, as, a, as a major bank in the Philippines, can you outline for us what the key opportunities are that you see in the energy transition, renewable energy um, in particular, and touch on energy efficiency, storage, if you like, um, and what factors you particularly look at when you're making investment decisions of different sorts. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you very much for being uh, part of this panel. Um, and I'm happy to share my views as well and, and, and the institution's views on this particular topic. I will direct my response primarily um, taking a perspective of the investors and the banks and what will direct and mobilize capital to sustainable development projects. I think there are a few factors that um, have been quite consistent in the priorities of the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum. Uh, the first one of, uh, of which is disclosure and transparency. The second one is uh, providing a regulatory framework, uh, a regulatory environment that will support and incentivize financial institutions and investors to allocate capital to projects and to raise its own financing dedicated to, to SDG projects. And the third one is around capacity building. So if I may, if I may just uh, focus first on disclosure, I think the lack of public data from companies around the world regarding their environmental impact um, may be hindering the development of sustainable financing. And we see a clear benefit in providing additional transparency and the market is likewise seeing outcomes of better disclosure and better management of ESG issues. And this can be seen in, um, we were just discussing it this morning, the MSCI's ESG Leaders Index. Uh, this is an equity index where you will see more and more of companies who provide good disclosure outperforming peers in Asia insofar as equity valuation is concerned. Um, we think that encouraging more signups to the task force and climate related disclosures um, and encourage, encouraging good standard envi uh, environmental, social and governance data will lead to more investor confidence and unlock, unlock capital. Um, second, I guess if I could just focus on uh, the regulatory framework uh, the governor earlier mentioned that he has, uh, the, the BSP has issued um, one circular on sustainable finance. Uh, banks are given a three year uh, period uh, to transition and actually lay out their framework. And uh, there is a draft being circulated on ESRM. And I think incentives um, to really encourage banks to to allocate capital will be very helpful in really spurring the development of financing. Um, we were discussing earlier about taxonomy and how that's really important in making sure that investors and banks have the proper framework uh, and tools to cl classify projects. One of the um, 
challenges that we've had when we arranged a bond for a large government um, financial institution was really ascertaining which projects would classify as sustainable. Um, and so that definition of what projects are uh, ESG would be very critical. Now, if I may, if I may just um, also share that, you know, as a UK uh, regulated bank, we are also encouraged very much by the capital requirements um, to really take a look and, and allocate our, our funding to renewable and to, uh, sustainability projects um, by getting a reprieve in terms of risk-weighted assets uh, where we're given a 25% discount. And that way, um, you know, you marry uh, appropriate capital allocation to such types of projects as well. And I guess the last point uh, I'd like to make is around capacity building where we really encourage, I guess, um, and we try to help our companies, our clients rather, uh, in terms of really putting together their framework, uh, understanding how to best transition and manage climate risks, um, and then how that then translates into accessing the capital markets uh, to be able to fund all these projects. So that's it from my, from my end, thank you. Thank you very much. So that's given us um, a further background on the sustainable finance um, context for getting into a more detailed discussion perhaps now on the project end. So where people are looking at um, accessing finance, lending and uh, investment at the project end in renewables and other sustainable energy projects. May I turn to you, um, Tony Coveney, and um, you've been as an overseas investor in the Philippines for some time doing renewables. Can you say what attracted you to the Philippines, how you see the opportunity here at local level and um, what factors that you as an international investor and developer look at when you're deploying capital? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsty, and uh, good afternoon to everybody in Manila and good morning to everybody in London. Uh, I'd like to thank the British Embassy, firstly, for inviting me to uh, join this panel uh, and thank also the Department of Energy, the Department of Finance and the BSP and all the other distinguished speakers uh, for the chance to uh, share our views and opinions on renewable energy in the Philippines. I'm very proud of the fact that Thomas Lloyd has been an investor in renewable energy uh, for 10 years. We celebrated 10 years uh, exactly to the week last week. Uh, and during that 10 week period, uh, sorry, 10 year period, um, as Kirsty mentioned, uh, we spent $50 million in 2013 and 2014 building the first utility scale solar plant uh, in San Carlos City on Negros Island. Uh, and that became a template for others to follow. We wouldn't have been able to do that without the support and help both of our local partners, Bronzo, um, but we wouldn't have also been able to achieve it without the support, guidance and leadership of the barangay captains, the mayors and the governor of Negros. We were attracted to the Philippines uh, by a number of, uh, a, a number of key facts. Uh, first off, the Philippines has almost unique combinations of solar capacity, wind capacity and biomass capacity. Uh, and we often describe it as the paradise of renewable energy. Uh, today, rather than uh, talk about solar, which is already featured in many of the presentations, I'm going to focus on biomass and our biomass portfolio. We've been investing in building uh, biomass plants on Negros using the sugarcane trash, the waste left in the field uh, after the harvest. And this process generates five key returns and five key benefits, uh, both for the farming community and the wider community. Benefit number one, we buy the trash from the farmers, which creates a new income stream from the waste material. Benefit number two, we clear the field for the farmer, thus sparing him the cost of actually doing anything to the trash himself, creating a cost saving, increasing, therefore increasing his margin. Benefit number three, as part of that uh, process, the clearing process, we help part till the land and create improved efficiencies, further improving the yield of the land and the returns to the farmers. 
Fourthly, and this was touched on briefly in one of the earlier presentations, by giving the farmers an alternative to burning the fuel, uh, sorry, burning the trash in the field, uh, we give them, we help create cleaner air. And that is not just cleaner air for, the, air for the people in that community. It's not even cleaner air for the Philippines. It's cleaner air for everybody to breathe. We all breathe the same air. Lastly, the fifth benefit, we create stable, stable locally generated electricity for the community. And that helps generate jobs. Uh, our plants, uh, when operational, create thousands of jobs themselves. And they create tens of thousands of uh, secondary and tertiary job opportunities. Our biomass is 24 seven base load capacity. It alleviates the need for imported diesel, uh, thus reducing the cost. It pro provides stability that allows solar, wind and other, uh, other power generation facilities to use. But most importantly, our plants generate three pesos per kilowatt hour back into the local community. That's three pesos per kilowatt hour in income to the farmers and additional economic benefits to the local community. These benefits are not only at the local level though, uh, as focused, uh, as mentioned earlier on, the Philippines has a trade deficit of which 7% is used in importing coal. So every peso spent on buying sugarcane trash, every peso spent on investing in biopower plants is a peso less spent on foreign, on foreign purchases of coal. One of the things that we focused on when we, when we look for investment is to ensure that there is a clear, secure and transparent regulatory, regu regulatory framework exactly as Lynette just described. Our first investments therefore were based on the 2008 Renewable Energy Act and the 2009 Clean Air Act. And we look forward to working with the government on the latest round of new regulations and new opportunities uh, for the next decade. As a foreign investor, we also need a level playing field to ensure that the work that we do uh, is, uh, is matched equally and treated as fairly as work done by local investors. We're coming out of the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis has given us all renewed enthusiasm and renewed vigor for investing to create jobs, investing to create new economic opportunity. And our own prime minister uh, has come up with the phrase, build back better. Uh, and this is very appropriate for the Philippines where Investments like ours create jobs and create economic growth. But most importantly, uh, the funding gap required, it's been picked on in several of the presentations, funding gap required means that this is bigger than any one organization or any one government's ability to fulfill. It can only be done by, by partnership. I'm proud of the fact that Thomas Lloyd is a British company. I'm proud of the fact that we were the first to invest in solar. I'm proud of the fact that we first to develop a blueprint for biomass uh, and I look forward to sharing further dialogue and further platforms with other interested parties uh, in order to help grow and achieve what can be done for the Philippines. The paradise, or as one of my colleagues calls you, the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. Uh, and on that note, actually, oh sorry, go ahead, I'll pass back to you. I was going to say, I thought you were finishing there. I've got, um, the clock, unfortunately, is ticking, but what a great uh, point to um, move across the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh, did, I, did I interrupt you, though, at the end? No, 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 no. Saudi Arabia was my punchline. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, on that note, I'll really uh, very, thank you very much. Um, and then let's move on to uh, uh, Dr. Yong Peng Jai. Um, really looking forward to your remarks. Um, perhaps explain briefly the role that the ADB plays, but uh, as highlighted by uh, the scene setting presentation, there is a, a huge focus and opportunity in the off grid and isolated market, as well as other parts of renewable energy. So very keen to hear how that fits in your strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christy, for, for your introduction. First of all, also, I want to also John, uh, our fellow uh, panelists in thanking the organizer, organizers actually, uh, our uh, host from the Philippines, uh, 
ADB is being uh, headquarters in Manila. I myself, I've been working in the Philippines for 21 years, and this is my home. Uh, more than my the time I spend in my own country. So uh, uh, this is very much, I have a lot of friends in the uh, Philippines, in the Department of Energy. I'll say uh, my best regard to my friend first. And also thank the British government, the embassy of uh, uh, UK in Manila. Uh, uh, and UK has been also Asian Development Bank's a long-term uh, partner. I have been involved in this COP26 Energy Transition Council. Uh, a lot of activities have been part of that. I have learned a lot and I hope also to make some contributions in this process. Uh, responding to Christie's question, actually, indeed, I wanted to share a bit of what ADB does uh, broadly before I come back to the specific question and potential in uh, responding to the, the scene setter and the, the the, uh, the presentation by Ms. Sarah. So uh, ADB uh, broadly, every year, our lending in the energy, energy sector across Asia is $5 billion per year. And $5 billion per year is very much less uh, than 1% of uh, the region's requirements. So there's 99% of money should come from uh, Ms. Ortiz, uh, Mr. Uh, Coverney and commercial sources, uh, that would actually make uh, a really a difference. But ADB, we are trying uh, to do uh, play a role with this uh, uh, amount of uh, resources. Uh, uh, $5 billion a year, half of, uh, of that, we are uh, investing in energy efficiency and energy uh, renewable energy. And the other half, mostly in uh, strengthening the grid system, power grid. And with a smart grid component, we, our belief is that uh, um, more and more the private sector, private capital, commercial banks would finance uh, renewable energy because this uh, energy source of energy becoming more and more competitive. But uh, as a development bank, public sector institution, we should focus on in areas that uh, would require us more uh, than the, when these uh, technologies are mature, they're a willing investors. So we are uh, spending half of our money in transmission and distribution, hoping that uh, a smart grid, a smarter grid and, uh, and flexible grid can take more and more higher share of renewable energy. So that's uh, the overall background on ADB's uh, intervention, but but in the Philippines, uh, uh, the picture looks very different uh, because I, I said that I spent 20 years in the Philippines. The first 10 years, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines so investing in different areas uh, as uh, uh, ADB, but uh, as uh, uh, Philippines go, have gone to uh, uh, restructuring in the power sector, in the energy sector, and the private sector has basically uh, been playing a high profile role and basically taking over uh, uh, all the uh, sector in terms of um, investment, in terms of operations, even the uh, transmission uh, uh, lines. So uh, our focus has, uh, in the Philippines have shifted to more and more to uh, outer island, supporting rural corps, and even beyond the rural corps, then in those areas that uh, 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 even the rural rural co-ops have uh, difficulties in, in providing, supporting uh, the uh, energy and electricity access. So in last three years, I've just cited two examples. We invested uh, that small money, but we invest supported a uh, uh, mini grid in the uh, Cobrado Island in Roblin, Roblin uh, province. And also uh, uh, another one, a mini grid in uh, Mala, Malalisan Island in Antique uh, province. So in both cases, uh, these are basically the uh, solar PV plus energy storage and plus a modern, uh, more efficient uh, diesel uh, 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 generator as a backup. So the hybrid system with the, uh, a high share of uh, solar in, in supporting rural uh, 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 access in the outer islands. In doing so, our objectives is to see whether there is a scope uh, for us to actually scale up these examples that we funded with grant money. Our hope is to see private sector capital coming also to this island to support uh, energy access. And learning from these uh, two examples, 
I would summarize these uh, uh, in, in, with four uh, letters, A, B, C, D. Uh, A being that uh, in supporting such uh, mini grid uh, uh, systems in the uh, remote area, uh, outer island, we need to actually to find the anchor load. It, it, the, just providing lighting is very unlikely to, to, to be able to reach a certain level of scale and to, uh, to actually making this uh, uh, investment uh, uh, viable. So uh, in those both cases, we were trying to see what kind of productive use of electricity we can develop in addition to the power we provide to household for uh, their lighting, for their household use. And this is uh, very important to find a uh, sizable anchor load. The second uh, letter that is B, uh, 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 because you have a load uh, enough uh, to support a business model. The business business model we should have to yeah. unfortunately move <laughs> towards wrapping up. I'm so sorry, but let's okay. keep going through the alphabet. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm finishing business model and community participation and demand side management. A, B, C, D. That's our key. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Jai. Uh, I'm so sorry to have to cut you off there, but um, it sounds to me like we could have an entire three hours uh, exploring and teasing out the opportunities and also the transferable lessons from the experiences that have already taken place to other areas that have a strong interest in learning from those. But um, let me, in I'm going to pass over to uh, ASIC, Paula now to run the Q&A session, but as I pass over, perhaps Sarah, you would like to um, sort of briefly respond to some of the points made and then Q&A can be picked up. But I'm going to say thank you to the to the panel and and leave over to to, for, to the Q&A session now. My, my role is over. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Kirsty. If I could jump for one minute, um, I think uh, Dr. Zai's uh, feedback uh, on ADB's role could be quite helpful here, uh, considering NPC SPUG is a state-owned en enterprise. If we could target um, support at hybridizing all of NPC SPUG's assets, that's, you know, that's under, that's $400 million of investment value, um, plus, plus on the job side and, and other opportunities. So perhaps that's something that, you know, private sector ADB um, and, and the NPC SPUG uh, would support from from DOE, DOF, and, and colleagues here today uh, can do in the short term, basically, you know, start start right away and, and get things going in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, for this Q&A, uh, we have two questions, but I think they have been answered uh, in our chat box, but we'll just read them again uh, for the panelists to give maybe some more comments or, you know, your own take. So the first question is, uh, in the recent virtual economic briefing, Secretary Kusi mentioned that FIT proved to be a big mistake as it forced electricity prices in the country upwards. So does the merit order effect still offset FIT allowance payments? And the second question is that, given that bids from renewable energy generation companies are not always the lowest, is there a need to incentivize REs in the competitive selection process? So if yes, how do we do this? So maybe we could, uh, since Sarah was one of those who answered, we could have the other panelists if they have any inputs. Sure, I'll, I'll go first if you like. Um, uh, Feed-in tariffs are a key part of the establishment process for renewable energy, um, but they're not a long-term solution. Feeding tariffs are how you allow investors and developers to build proof of concept. Uh, and that was a key part of the rationale behind the 2008 Renewable Energy Act uh, and a key part of the decision making processes that we started back in 2010 and 2011 in order to support the first renewable energy project uh, in 2014. Um, however, going forward, uh, they can and should be replaced by long term. Uh, solutions. And I think you've seen uh, across Europe and across America where feeding tariffs are used to establish processes, used to uh, complete proof of concepts, uh, and then are slowly replaced by long-term reverse auction systems, which provide the scalability 
uh, for renewable energy to become a key part of the energy mix. Thank you, Tony. Um, are there any other panelists that wish to give their insights? Okay, hearing none, I think that wraps up our second panel. Uh, we'd like to thank all our panelists and our um, speakers. So uh, we now move on to our panel three, which is the energy efficiency or opportunity and role of the local government be moderated by Ms. Laurie Navarro. So Ms. Laurie Navarro is the president of the CSI Energy Solutions International. This is a consulting company on energy and environment based in the Philippines and provides services in the region. So Laurie has over 35 years of experience in clean energy leadership, program management and relationship building with public and public sector partners and stakeholders in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. So Laurie, uh, we yield the floor to you. Thank you so much, Asik Paula. Okay, uh, before I call on our scene setter presenter, who is uh, Director Patrick Aquino, please allow me to say a few words about him. Director Aquino is currently the Director of the Energy Utilization Management Bureau under the Philippine Department of Energy. He is a Career Executive Service Officer, Rank 3, and he has served in various capacities in the DOE, from the Office of the Secretary, Information Technology Management Service and Energy Policy and Planning Bureau. With the passage of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act in 2019, after more than three decades or almost three decades of its initial draft in 1988, now Director Aquino with the support of the DOE stands at the forefront of the implementation of the energy efficiency and conservation in the country. Let us welcome Director Aquino. Good after, good, good day, everyone. Uh, allow me to do a quick presentation to, to set the tone uh, for this panel. Uh, thank you. So this, uh, we would like to term this as opportunities under the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. Um, it's uh, three decades in the making, and, and we do hope uh, to start really mobilizing big ticket projects. This particular presentation will cover all of the aspects of the EEC Act. Uh, let me just start off with the Government Energy Management Program. Um, this is being administered uh, and guided by the Interagency Energy Efficiency and Conservation IAEECC Committee. And we do have an existing issuance, actually two right now. Uh, members of the committee are also joining us um, in this forum one of which is the adoption of the government energy management program to cover our local government unit um, partners. So now it's a whole of government approach. And one of the key takeaways that we're trying to do under the GEMP is to improve fuel consumption by at least 10%. And some of the measures that we're undertaking to help us achieve that uh, includes uh, the expanded role of our local government unit partners uh, with the establishment of certain things. Um, this is a seven item listing actually here. Uh, and we're very pleased that the DILG as well as the league of our local government units have been very supportive in this. Um, rest assured on our part uh, on the creation of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Office uh, on the assistance with respect to the local energy efficiency and conservation plan. Uh, these are there are ongoing capability and capacity uh, building uh, webinars right now that we're conducting. I actually just came from one uh, earlier today and this afternoon. Uh, so rest assured to our partners that we will continue our work in providing you with the necessary tools to work and implement the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. Some forthcoming policies to expect a uh, uh, recent development is really on a timeline for the shift for government buildings uh, to shift to energy efficient uh, light emitting diodes or LEDs as part of the compliance mechanisms in the GAMP. Uh, this was just recently approved by the IAEECC. It is for publication. Um, it sets out for a five-year timeline uh, beginning 2022, so 2027 latest within all of our government facilities 
uh, would have switched to the more energy efficient uh, light emitting uh, diode or LEDs for their facilities and buildings. Uh, I do take this opportunity also to highlight uh, and do a gentle reminder to our LGU partners with respect to the compliance on the requirements under the uh, GEMP. Um, this is just a snapshot of where we are. As you can see, in terms of savings, um, based on those that have reported, uh, it's already almost 100 million. Uh, and what we can see is that the moment we expand this and we do the more activities in energy efficiency, these savings will be funneled into your respective offices as well. This is something that we'd like to highlight. We can do a screen share of this or snapshot. Um, we did a survey uh, with the World Bank actually uh, in 2017 that really showed the, you know, in select government facilities here in the central, uh, in the national capital region, the potential of doing a retrofit in terms of uh, the electricity cost. And what you can see is that there's a multiplier effect. And this is what we are saying. Uh, we're just doing two items here, uh, lighting and air conditioning. So the potential is right there. Uh, copies of this report are incidentally available also um, in the DOE website. For private sector, uh, we talk about energy service companies. I think uh, we were joined, uh, Ms. Laurie is also aware of this. Uh, we do allow uh, for participation of investors in terms of energy service companies. To date, there are 43 registered ESCOs um, with the Department of Energy covering a whole set of uh, tools and activities uh, to support your energy efficiency journey from audits to financing, technical expertise, and engineering, uh, including the equipment supply and installation. So this is uh, the listing of the 43 as of the end of April. Now, we do also talk on the role of uh, ESCOs uh, for the private sector as an opportunity for district cooling. Uh, this is something that the Philippine market is very right uh, to undertake. Uh, we would like uh, to ask for, especially in the central business districts, to start moving in this direction. And we're just putting out the word there so that our LGU partners are also aware um, that for central business districts and the commercial uh, facilities, um, the district cooling system is something worthwhile uh, to go into. In terms of the energy efficiency projects undertaken by our private sector as a new business market, uh, from the monitoring of the DOE from 2020, total investments cost already reached uh, 689 million with savings. Uh, it's estimated at 209 million pesos. Uh, the listing shows you that these are the various things. This is not the exhaustive list of the projects under energy efficiency that you can undertake, but these are real savings generated from undertaking these projects. Uh, we do also want to share with you that uh, the issue uh, the guidelines, at least on the endorsement component for the energy efficiency projects has also been issued. It is for publication on our end. On the part of the BOI, uh, they have already issued uh, the processing requirement. There is a 15% threshold uh, savings uh, requirement here to access the listed uh, income tax holidays here. Uh, you can also do it uh, self-finance, but the hurdle rates has to really meet the minimum of 15% at the very least. Uh, for our local government unit partners, the guidelines on energy conserving design for buildings uh, is already out. Uh, it's available in our DOE website. Um, this would cover at least three things on the building envelope, electrical systems and mechanical systems. Um, this initially covers uh, those with electrical loads of 112.5 kBA, or in short, those with 10,000 square meters total gross floor areas. It provides for very practical things that you can start implementing to reduce your energy footprint uh, with respect to these facilities. Yeah. And in terms for this, we also want to echo the message of our uh, earlier panelists and, and your earlier speakers. Under the EEC Act, RE system use uh, can be deemed and is part of the compliance. And in fact, under the guidelines of energy conserving design for buildings, there is a recognition that for new constructions and retrofits, at least 1% of the building's requirements should be met by renewable energy uh, power systems or technologies. And these are some of the options. Incidentally, uh, availing of the green energy option program for these facilities can be their compliance to this 1%. And then just to tease you on how we've come along in terms of green buildings, these are the listing of what we've monitored uh, in terms of green buildings in the countries uh, through our private sector partners, Verde Philippine Green Building Council, 
and the Philippine Green Building Initiative. As you can see, these are actual projects that have been completed or ongoing, uh, generating uh, energy savings as well as reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So in terms of e-mobility, this is another field that when we talk about efficiency, and I think our local government unit partners, along with our DOT, our colleagues have been talking big on the role of e-mobility, the shift to these systems. Uh, this can potentially be the game changer. Uh, there are pending measures in uh, both the Senate and the House on this, and it will be crucial that the national government, along with the LGUs, really integrate uh, in making sure that we create this enabling and conducive environment to allow for these technologies to take off. And now segueing also to the smart grid. These are really the new technologies that we are seeing that can help both manage supply and as well as demand that can really trigger uh, the resiliency and the sustainability components that allows us to reach our SDG and NDC goals. With respect to the private sector, going back again, these are the coverage of the energy intensive industries. Uh, there are three types right now. There was a deadline uh, on the 15th of April. It covers, uh, these are based on energy consumption, uh, both fuel and electricity. Um, we do a specific uh, discussion on this, but suffice to say, the next slide will show you uh, the opportunities for this would include energy management systems, building management, again, the energy audit. Um, these are the pool of what we're seeing in terms of consumption uh, from the commercial, industrial, and transport sectors of the entities that would be requiring uh, a shift or investing in terms of energy efficiency projects. And then I think these are, I'm down to my last uh, two or three slides. Uh, we do take this opportunity also to tell you that we do now have a formal framework for the Philippine Energy Labeling Program covering air conditioners, refrigerating appliances, television sets, and lighting products. It's really aimed at uh, empowering consumers at the point of sales, of course, leading to the greenhouse gas emission reduction. This is incidentally tied also to our minimum energy performance for product wherein we've started setting minimum energy performance ratings for those products that I've mentioned so that we are slowly phasing out the inefficient uh, energy consuming products in the market. Uh, these are things that we will also be working with our local government unit partners in terms of compliance, in monitoring the labeling um, requirements. Uh, this would include having the physical labels attached in the, the uh, appliances itself, as well as doing those verification uh, and enforcement activities. In terms of the importation, we see this again as an impor uh, important uh, opportunity. Uh, meeting the PELP and the MEPP requirements is something that would require um, investment and uh, business opportunities. Yes, and I think I heard my bell, so I'm now <laughs> back to the last two slides and I'll just slide on through them. But incidentally, the final slide is on waste management. Uh, we will be working and reaching out to our LGU partners along with the ENR on this because the waste generated from the shift to energy efficiency should be properly managed and disposed of. Thank you, Ms. Laurie. Back to you. Thank you so much, Director Patrick. You just beat the time. Okay. Uh, thank you for that very exhaustive uh, presentation on energy effic efficiency opportunities, not only for the local government, but for the private sector as well. Okay, I, so my reactors may please uh, request you to please uh, start your video before I introduce you quickly. So first, uh, do you see Nolly there? Nolly, are you there? Nolly yes, Cruz, here. okay, is currently the vice president and head of the program development and management one department of the Development Bank of the Philippines. He has more than 27 years of experience in banking, handling renewable energy projects for MSMEs, and has also been involved in projects on energy, water supply, and sanitation. Second is uh, Arlene. Arlene is the head of the Public Affairs, Communications, and Sustainability for Nestle Philippines. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Nestle Philippines, and a Nestle global coach and mentor. I wouldn't want to miss the fact that she says uh, here that she is married with two kids. Great. Next is Dr. Alma Madrazo, who is an adjunct faculty at the University of the Philippines National Graduate School of Engineering, 
Engineering Graduate Program. She's currently in the Board of Trustees of NPOP 4.0, an organization of energy efficiency and conservation management practitioners, professionals, and consultants. And last but not the least, we have uh, Joe Mangilat Yoseko, who is the Senior Energy Efficiency Strategy Expert of the EU Supported Access to Sustainable Energy Program. ASEP provides technical assistance to DOE in the implementation of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act and its IRR. Okay, maybe I'd like to call first on Joe. Uh, Joe, having worked really quite a bit with local LGUs and knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are, what do you think remain to be the major barriers or challenges that LGUs face to be able to, for them to, you know, face head on the challenges uh, of uh, the energy efficiency opportunities. Thank you, Laurie. Good afternoon, everyone. And first, let me thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to join this forum. I'm sorry, but uh, my camera is not working. So please bear with me. No worries, Joe. The EU Access to Sustainable Energy Program, or ASEP, has long supported DOE in its energy efficiency policy development work, especially related to the EEC law and its IRR, as well as in the implementation of key EE programs. We have also engaged LGUs across the country on their roles and contributions to the implementation of the EEC law. Based on the DOE presentation and to answer your question, Lori, there are untapped opportunities for E at the local level. First, at the policy and planning level, one of the biggest untapped opportunities is the integration of EE in the LGU long-term plan and in its medium-term, multi-year, and multi-sector CDP, or the Comprehensive Development Plan. This is consistent with the long-term nature of energy efficiency policies and programs, and local energy plans must be consistent and supportive of the Philippine energy plan that runs from 2018 to 2015. At present, energy can be found in the LGU environment and natural resources sector, or the economic sector, or even the infrastructure sector for power generation. The creation of the EEC office, designation of the EEC officer, and development of local EEC plants are critical steps at the right direction, as mentioned by Director Patrick. Second, at the program level, the DOE template for local EEC plan has identified three major programs, such as increasing energy efficiency at local facilities, buildings, schools, and hospitals, RE installations, and even e-mobility. Based on our engagement with LGUs, most of them cited the priorities as priorities the retrofitting of street lights to LED, improving efficiency of government buildings through the Green Building Code and the recently launched 2020 guidelines on energy conserving design of buildings prepared by DOE and the use of electric vehicles in high demand droughts. The untapped opportunity here is scaling up these programs and projects beyond demonstration or pilot projects. The main challenges, on the other hand, in the implementation of EE programs at the local level can be summarized into three. One, limited investment capital. Two, lack of incentives to move beyond budget funded expenditure and explore innovative funding mechanisms, even with the private sector. And three, limited or no capacity to implement EE programs that require special skills or highly technical competencies. In closing, the stakeholders here can unlock lots of EE opportunities if we can help integrate EE in long, local long-term and medium-term plans, help scale up EE projects identified in local EEC plans, and address the challenges and barriers in realizing the full potential 
of LGUs. So that's about it, um, Lori. And again, thank you for this chance. Thank you very much, Joe. That's quite a bit. Okay, thinking off from what Joe said, that local government units would need financing options beyond what the regular budgets can provide. Maybe I'd like to call on now on Nolly. Nolly, for uh, the LGU, for example, to take on the development and implementation of energy efficiency projects, they definitely would need funding. And maybe the, the default would go would be to go to a GFI like uh, the Development Bank of the Philippines. What can you offer for such a funding requirement of LGUs? Well, thank you, Laurie. And also thank you to Director uh, Patrick for the very informative and comprehensive presentation a while ago. And good afternoon, everyone. For the LGU, uh, we have what we call uh, in DBP the uh, Energy Efficiency Financing uh, Energy Efficiency Savings Financing Program, or E2 Save. This uh, financing program allows for loan repayment based on savings and lo loan amortization based on 80% of monthly energy savings provided loan tenor shall not exceed 10 years, and then 100, 100% financing for public institutions. So it's not only LGU, but also other uh, government institutions such as, such as the government owned and controlled corporations. And also it supports no, uh, the energy service companies and also uh, energy service providers uh, uh, by, by uh, the, providing them the omnibus term loan facility covering the two years pipeline projects. So what could they benefit from here? No? Uh, meaning to say, uh, in terms of investment, we could already support them 100%, including, no, including no, I, I forgot to mention, the requirement for investment grade audit or energy audit. So that's something that we, uh, a package that we offer for the LGU. Uh, 10 years is uh, generous enough for energy efficiency. And therefore, uh, I would say this package, no, um, could really uh, address the requirement of the LGU in terms of investment on energy efficiency. Uh, with regards to my reaction no, to uh, the presentation made by uh, Director Patrick uh, a while ago, I just, noticed, I just noticed that in the presentation, the percentage compliance in the government energy management program is quite low at 4.86% despite the very attractive project investment payback period of 2.5, two and a half years no, for lighting and four years for air conditioning. So this is, a, I believe, a factual data and really a very attractive one. I think this, uh, I think this is uh, also the reason why the Department of Energy will push for the policy for the use of the light emitting diode no, or LED. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, energy efficiency on the government buildings. Further, the number of energy service companies no, are already increased to 43 as of April 30, 2021. This is not really to repeat, but to highlight, no, uh, this ESCO uh, could also be tapped by the LGUs, no, given the right, uh, you know, uh, policy. No? I understand there are still issues on the procurement, also on the COA, as well as on the DBM. Uh, but uh, should there be uh, solutions no, uh, be made and maybe policy should be out soon, uh, I see that uh, there would be an increased uptake on, on the LGU and even to other government agencies on the compliance, particularly uh, to GMP. Because uh, obviously there is a 10% no, requirement for them to reduce electricity consumption. So uh, DBP also expresses support to DOE's initiative on e-mobility and on the use of smart grid technologies. We certainly need the, ch the charging stations to increase the commercialization of electric vehicles. However, while on transition, because we're looking at 2040 here, there is a need to guide the buyers on the technical limitation of electric vehicles, such as limited driving range and battery issues. And finally, uh, demand-side management is really key to achieving sustainable energy development. And it, it is the low-hanging fruit that we can pursue to reduce energy demand and greenhouse gas emissions. So thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Nolly. Now let me call on Dr. Alma Madrazo. Can you please share with us what your thoughts are and reactions to the Sinsetter presentation of Director Patrick? Alma, please. 
Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to congratulate Dr. Uh, Director Patrick for a very comprehensive uh, presentation of uh, the projects, the different initiatives of DOE, especially their uh, unit in implementing the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. Uh, what I noticed there, I mean, he enumerated the three, uh, there were like seven roles of the LGUs. I am kind of thinking about capacity building for the LGU because they're expected to establish their own respective energy efficiency and conservation offices, right? And then it will be headed by an energy conservation officer. Uh, in, in NPAP, we are very actively uh, training energy conservation officers and energy managers. And uh, we're starting to invite some uh, LGU representatives right now. But I think there should be a more thorough program to uh, teach the LGU about energy efficiency and conservation because they are expected to like in the in their in their case now they're expected to work with the planning and development office right now because they still haven't established no and they're they're supposed to come up or draft their own local energy efficiency and conservation plans so they would be needing help along that line so training and capacity building is really important. And for LGUs to, to um, assist the OE, there's also another provision in the law that LGUs uh, are, shall assist the OE in ensuring compliance of designated establishments with their uh, obligations. So I think um, that's a very good move because they are the ones really on the ground. But I think they really need to, to be trained and to know more about energy efficiency and conservation uh, to the point that they will be able to carry out what is expected from them. And having these provisions in the energy efficiency and conservation law helps integrate EENC into the LGU level, integrating it and putting it in the mainstream, which means that the the uh, implementation of the RA11285 will be strengthened because it will now go down to the LGU level. As we all know, energy efficiency is considered as the best source of clean energy. energy. Yeah. So I think uh, we need to have a good capacity building program for the LGUs. Thank you very much, Alma, for that very detailed uh, uh, analysis of uh, what needs to be done further on top of what have already been done or are being done by various agencies. Okay, let me now turn to our last panelist, Arlene Tan Bantoto from Nestle. Nestle, as we know, is not new to energy efficiency. Even before the uh, energy efficiency and conservation law, they have been into energy efficiency activities. So Arlene, if you could please uh, share with us what your initiatives are at Nestle and what uh, future activities you plan to do to integrate EE measures in your business operations. What challenges do you face? Arlene, please. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you to the organizers, uh, especially Asset Paula for the invitation. Um, and of course, um, thank you to Director Patrick for your very comprehensive uh, presentation as well. So first of all, um, Nestle Philippines, we support the government's NDG goals and commitments. And in fact, in uh, last April 30, Nestle Philippines made a bold commitment of going net zero carbon by 2050. And now let me share what we do in our factories. Um, so energy efficiency has long been a priority for us, even before our net zero commitments. We have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions in our factories by 40% since 2010, and also reduce our water usage by 24% and energy usage by 38%. So what have we, what, um, what have we been doing? Number one is we are using biomass boilers. So using spent coffee grounds and other biomass such as coconut shell and sawdust to generate steam for production heating requirement. Um, one opportunity is I, I was just talking to our technical guys and in fact, we don't have enough biomass. So if we had more, we, we could save even more um, electricity. 
The second is we use biogas as boiler fuel. And by doing so, we have reduced the use of LPG fuel. Next is heat recovery system are utilized in our utilities generation equipment. The heat recovered will reduce consumption of fuel for steam or hot water generation. Finally, we have switched to clean energy. Three of our factories in Luzon and our admin office here in Makati are all 100% renewable electricity. So an opportunity for us is to move our last factory, which is in Cagayan de Oro, to renewable electricity. And I understand that today it is not available yet. Um, we, are, we still have a lot of work to do, obviously, as Nestle being one of the biggest uh, food and beverage uh, manufacturer in the Philippines. And um, we are developing innovative solutions. For instance, adaptation of new technologies, both on our process and services. Um, there are some very technical terms here. Uh, so you have um, heat recovery, MVR, heat pumps, um, roaster heat recovery, et cetera. So please don't ask me to explain. <laughs> Second is, of course, to make sure that we move from fossil fuels to biomass. Today, as I said, we don't have enough biomass and not all our factories are using biomass. Next is on-site biogas generation. So generation of biogas through anaerobic digestion of wastewater constituents, which can then be fired in steam boilers. So aside from energy efficiency, we are also, um, we have, we also have numerous water initiatives to ensure that we make the most out of this precious resource. For instance, we have rainwater catchment. So water collected is used for chillers and air conditioning systems. We have effluent water reuse. So wastewater are all treated and used in irrigation for farms and in toilet um, and in cooling towers. Process sealing water is used for industrial services and other secondary applications such as the water toilet flushing. And finally, agri-services initiatives. So we have uh, been partnering with farmers since 1962 for our Nescafe plan. And we are teaching farmers about water reservoir, rainwater collection, and shade trees. Um, to end, uh, first is, Lori, we had the conversation earlier and then you were sharing with me that there are tax incentives already and which need to be operationalized. So we are very happy and excited about it and looking forward to apply for it. Next is, um, of course, uh, we are fully committed to go to really increase our energy efficient. And finally, just on energy electric fleet, of course, we also hope that there will be uh, tax incentives because today, to change one car, which is not energy efficient, you pay double the price. So I hope there will be some measures on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arlene. So we got very varied inputs, very useful inputs from our four panelists. So at this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Director Patrick, if you have any reactions to what our panelists have shared. Yeah, I think just one, one point and, and we're here we, we do appreciate that uh, Nestle is already echoing something that uh, we, we need to work on incentivizing the shift to electric vehicles. And there are pending measures right now in both the House of, Repres House of Representatives and Senate. And it, we do hope all of us here in government will support that trust so that we can incentivize and get our transition in uh, electric vehicles for the country. That's the only thing. I, I found an opportunity to promote it. So thank you, ma'am, for saying that. Back to you, Ms. Laurie. Thank you, Director Patrick. Okay, uh, do we still have time or should I pass it on to Asik Paula now? Ms. Laurie, it's not a time for the Q&A session. We have time, okay. For the no, Q&A. No, Ms. Laurie, for the Q&A. Okay. So uh, let me pass it on to uh, Asek Paula. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, okay. So, so thank you, Miss Laurie. And I think we have no more questions from the Q and A chat box. But you know, if you have any insights that you want to ask our panelists before we go to panel four. 
maybe you, you could give your insights also as closing, Ma'am Ma Lori. Yeah. yeah, I think there's really a lot of opportunities uh, on energy efficiency. I shared the analysis of Dr. Alma here that LGUs play a major role, but they need still a lot of handholding to really give them the capacity, the confidence of doing what they are expected to do. So that's uh, a personal experience that I've had while working for uh, a project dealing with a local government unit. The interest is there. The support is there. They just have to understand how they should be able to do what they are expected to do. So capacity building is one thing that they definitely need. Of course, on top of funding, that's the reason why uh, the sharing of knowledge here is very important. And I hope that the DBP, your terms and conditions are really friendly to our potential borrowers from both the, the government and the private sector. That's about it from, from me, Asek Paula. Back to you. Thank you, ma'am, for those insights. Um, they're, they're really very helpful. And thank you to all our, all our panelists, especially our private sector participants as well, and uh, Director Patrick for also giving us a background on how we could actually have energy efficiency. So moving on to our last panel, it is about accelerating financing for the energy transition to be moderated by Commissioner Efiro Amatong. So Commissioner Amatong was appointed in the Securities and Exchange Commission in 2014 and is currently the Supervising Commissioner for the Markets and Securities Regulation Department and the Economic Research and Training Department. So Commissioner F. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, and thank you very much to those uh, uh, who are still on board and listening and made it to panel four. Uh, the most exciting panel, at least for me, <laughs> for today's <laughs> finance, uh, finance forum, primarily because this is the panel that's going to talk about funding. Or in uh, Tagalog, san ba natin huhugutin yung pera or pondo para sa mga projects na to, no? Where are we going to get the money to fund this energy transition that is important to all of us? Okay, so to start us off and introduce us to the various uh, funding options and funding uh, tools available is Mr. Russell Marsh. Uh, Marsh. Russell uh, leads the UK government's ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Program, or LSEP, and is also a director in Ernst & Young's infrastructure advisory team focused on green finance and renewable energy. So Russell, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Amatong, for that introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. And thanks to the British Embassy and to the Department of Finance for inviting me to speak um, this afternoon. As I know, we're behind, um, running behind time. I will try and get through my presentation relatively quickly so that we can get into the, the panel discussion and hear um, the views of, um, of those uh, on, on the panel. So let me just um, get through my, uh, my slides, excuse me. So, um, so I'm going to give a very quick overview of, of what we mean when we talk about um, green and sustainable finance, a little bit of an update of where green and sustainable finance is in the Philippines, and then we will move into, um, into the discussion. So firstly, in terms of um, the overview of green and sustainable uh, finance, sorry, my computer stopped working, sorry. Um, in terms of the overview of green and sustainable finance, I'm starting off with, you know, what does uh, green and sustainable finance mean? How do you define it? And one of the challenges is one of the questions we often ask is what do, what do we mean by um, green and sustainable finance? Um, and this, this slide it looks to try and um, give a break that down and define what we mean by sustainable finance um, and effectively it, it's a lot of things in both, both um, on the environmental side but also um, on the social economic and governance side and obviously where we tend to focus and a lot of the focus of today is on the left hand side of that where we're talking about um, climate change mitigation um, low carbon uh, and and particular and green and so how, how can we uh, accelerate the transition and how can we refinance um, those activities. 
So I indicated that, you know, um, sustainable finance, uh, sorry, the sustainable finance um, is complicated and there's a range of different products in the market. And what this slide looks to do is just outline that different range of sustainable finance products, um, everything on from, from green loans, what they call green bonds, social loans and social bonds, You've now got blue bonds, there's things called gender bonds, there's transition bonds. There are a whole range of, of sustainable finance products in the market that can be used to finance a range of activities um, and a range of infrastructure activities um, across, across the different, different sectors of the economy and understanding how you can use them and what you can use them for um, is one of, the, one of the challenges. But again, there is various different sustainable finance products in the market that can be used to fund and finance um, green uh, projects, sustainable projects. So say in this, in this instance, um, you know, low carbon energy or, or projects looking at reducing um, carbon emissions. So what does that mean for um, the Philippines? So one of the interesting things is again, I mean, there is no formal definition of sustainable finance in the Philippines. Um, there is the definition that's within the BSP sustainable finance framework, and I think that's generally agreed to be, you know, broadly um, a, a reasonable and fair definition of, of sustainable finance. But it's, it's basically around integrating environmental, social, and governance criteria into into business decisions. So, you know, if, how do you actually ensure that the, the business activities are taking into account um, their environmental, social? Uh, and, and government's impacts. And there are a number of other definitions um, globally, whether that's in the UK, European Commission, or within um, what's called, uh, or, the, or the ICMA, um, the International Capital Market Associations, all broadly broadly similar, although with some, some minor, minor differences. So then what does that mean in terms of um, what's been going on in the Philippines? Um, and both the BSP and the SEC have for a number of years and are continuing to increase um, the requirements, the support they're providing to uh, the sectors that they're responsible for to, to increase this integration of environmental, social and governance criteria within those business decisions. And on this slide, we just highlighted some of those um, activities, say both in terms of the guidance and regulations that SEC has issued and those that, that the BSP um, have issued. And you heard um, earlier that, you know, the BSP have further circulars um, related to sustainable finance um, in, in development. And then finally, my final two slides, just indicating kind of, okay, what does that mean in terms of, you know, um, how have these instruments been used um, so far, um, particularly in the Philippines? This shows, um, this is a slide around the issuance of bonds in, or sustainable bonds in ASEAN. So that's bonds that are either labelled as green, um, social or or sustainability, um, and this shape has shows you uh, the volume and the number of bonds that have been issued across uh, ASEAN. I mean, it's interesting to note. I mean, Philippines is one of the largest in terms of number of uh, of issuances, and again, unsurprisingly, I mean, green bonds are still the the largest share of those issuances, um, but we are starting to see social and sustainability bonds in increasingly being being issued. And then finally, um, just what does that what what does that mean in terms of the Philippines? So, what actually what has been um, issued in the Philippines? And this shows um, a list of the uh, sustainable bonds, whether that's green, social, and sustainability bonds that have been issued uh, in the Philippines to finance a range of activities. Um, and in particular, if you obviously look on the left hand side of the slide, um, a range of bonds, green bonds, have been issued to finance um, renewable energy um, and energy efficiency and other low carbon energy related projects. So it's clear that um, certainly in the Philippines, you know, the market has recognized um, that you can use uh, the green bonds as an appetite for using green bonds to finance, um, say low carbon energy activities. And I think, you know, again, we'll, we'll hear now into the panel session about how um, local governments can start to potentially access some of those instruments to finance, um, you know, low carbon energy um, projects within their um, within their jurisdictions. So that's the end of my um, my presentation. Um, I'll, I'll hand back to, to Commissioner Amatong for the uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Russell, for that uh, outline of the funding options and, and available funding products uh, 
in the green social and sustainability uh, uh, space. And if you if you didn't do the math quickly, and if you didn't notice in uh, in Russell's slides, since 2016, at the start of the Duterte administration, Philippine issuers have apparently issued 4.1 billion U.S. dollars of green social and sustainability bonds, uh, not yet including the LGUs that are in attendance today, but that's. 4.1 billion US dollars worth of uh, funding through uh, sustainable finance instruments. So if there's funding avail available, and this is something that we've uh, heard from the market, that there's ample funding available for green, social, and sustainable projects. The big question uh, that many uh, we hear many times from um, banks and, and asset managers are, are there enough projects to finance with all that money? And for this, let's uh, talk to uh, uh, Director uh, uh, J.D. Zafe. He's the head of the Project Development uh, Department of the PPP Center. Uh, Director J.D., from the point of view of the PPP Center, uh, are there projects here in the Philippines that uh, LGUs can put together in order to tap that funding that's uh, widely available? Uh, good, good, good afternoon, Commissioner, and good afternoon to the rest of the panel four members and our audience who stick it out with us in this late afternoon. Yes, there is a the PPP Center uh, is currently uh, uh, supporting the development and uh, the progress of a pipeline of projects of uh, of local PPP projects right now. Um, we think that this will grow based on uh, this pipeline will still grow based on the demand for capacity building interventions from us as well as the growth that we've seen in the volume of unsolicited proposals that the LGUs are receiving and uh, the pro pro proliferation of updated local co local PPP codes and local joint venture codes and investment codes. This pipeline of projects stems from uh, is composed of the typical uh, local projects in water and sanitation, uh, as well as solid waste management and the government enterprises, public markets, other houses. But recently, we've seen uh, a handful of projects that are in the sector of renewable energy and energy efficiency. While while we are still, uh, the, 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 there are challenges uh, that uh, being faced by local governments in moving forward with these emerging PPP projects in this sector, we've seen though that they are growing in numbers, proving that a PPP, a PPP arrangement or a joint venture arrangement as mentioned in our panel two discussion is one of the viable option in uh, creating a pipeline of project that will be able to tap these available sustainable financing. Thanks for that, Director uh, JD. Very quickly, just, just to follow up, uh, because the previous panel pointed out you know, the need for capacity building at the LGU level. So it, you know, if, if PPP Center sees that there's a potential for this pipeline of projects coming at the local government level, is there anything that PPP Center does with, uh, with the local governments to help the local governments uh, really realize the potential of this pipeline of projects? Thanks, Commissioner. Yes, uh, the PPP Center, in partnership with our uh, the other agencies, the ILG, DBP, and BLGF, uh, there there is a menu of uh, support that the local government units uh, and what and other and other agencies at the local level, the water districts as well as economic zones, can tap uh, for project develop for project preparation and transaction advisory needed to come up with feasibility studies and um, tender documents. We have platforms wherein the LGUs and these agencies can tap in order to commission those studies and help them develop uh, a, re a robust uh, project, uh, PPP project or joint venture project that will also cover a study on the possible financing for these uh, potential projects. There is also the usual capacity building workshops available. And recently, we've adapted uh, a, a um, an online uh, an online version of the capacity building workshops in in recognition of our limited travel uh, uh, capacities uh, because of the pandemic. And there are knowledge products available that we are uh, that we have partnered with uh, University of the Philippines and DILG, uh, which covers 
guidelines on joint venture, template contracts, and um, guidelines on updating your JV code and PPP codes, uh, which are available to, the, to our local government units. In fact, Commissioner, we have partnered with some cities, provinces, and municipalities through a collaboration MOA, wherein we have developed a work plan to come up with a pipeline of projects as well as other intervention, interventions that they would need to really make a robust uh, pipeline of projects and hopefully more in the RE and EE sector. Back to you, Commissioner. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Director JD. So, you know, for, for our listeners, there's a whole suite of support that PPP Center is, is prepared to provide to our LGUs. Uh, and, and they're even prepared to do this online, especially during, uh, it's very convenient given the pandemic. But one of the, one of the partner agencies that you mentioned, uh, Director JD, is the Bureau of Local Government Finance. So maybe we can turn to Executive Director Nino uh, Alvina, uh, who's joining us also this afternoon. Uh, ED Nino, I know it's not a straightforward process uh, for an LGU to access uh, funding outside of their normal uh, local taxes or their share in the internal revenue allotment. So the local government code allows uh, the LGUs to raise money, not only through revenue mechanisms, but also through borrowing, uh, whether uh, straight loans or, or maybe the issuance of municipal bonds. But I know it's... It, Historically, it's not been a straightforward process, but I understand that uh, BLGF has actually managed to try to streamline uh, this process of, of uh, 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 LGUs um, accessing the debt markets. Can you talk to us uh, a bit about you know, what you've done to make it easier for LGUs uh, to borrow for projects? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh... Thank you, Commissioner uh, F, and to the British Embassy for inviting us. Uh, let, let me just give a quick uh, comment on the presentation of uh, Russell, and I think it really underscores the uh, importance of sustainable finance in the context of financing local economic development. And at the same time, he provided us uh, uh, the international uh, perspectives. And uh, just like what Commissioner F mentioned, it's a recognized fact that uh, funding support is really available on the supply side. But we also recognize, as discussed in the earlier panels, that um, there are challenges as to the level of interest and uh, capacity of local governments to tap these financing uh, sources or, or the demand side, as well as the viability of local uh, projects according to to scope, to the scale for these uh, financing modalities, particularly on bonds or credit financing. And uh, that's a very good point from uh, PPP also that uh, there must be a viable pipeline of uh, local projects that could be financed not just by the traditional sources, but by the non-traditional financing mechanisms. So to go to uh, uh, your uh, main question, uh, Commissioner, right now under the existing uh, regulatory framework for credit financing, there are three main uh, control points. One is uh, the limit of the borrowing capacity and uh, debt servicing of local governments. Second is the uh, opinion of the monetary board uh, as to the effect of uh, local borrowing on the monetary and uh, balance of payments. Uh, and lastly, of course, the local legislative authorization for such uh, financing uh, decisions. So on the part of the BLGF, uh, we do the, the first uh, control point, which is to certify uh, how much an LGU can service for debts and how much it can borrow. Uh, at the outset, I, I would like to uh, mention that under the local government code, all local governments can borrow for purposes specified under the law, particularly, of course, for capital expenditures. But again, these are uh, subject to the statutory limit, and uh, which is 20% of their regular uh, income, the borrowing capacity. And uh, they can borrow uh, or contract uh, loans uh, uh, with any government or domestic, private bank, and other lending institutions. So it's not exclusive only to government uh, lending institutions. So when a local government uh, intends to uh, borrow, uh, we issue the certification that it can pay and it can uh, it, it's within its limit. Uh, previously, uh, local governments need to comply around 12 
documentary requirements. But in 2016, Secretary Dominguez uh, signed Department Order 54 2016, wherein we streamlined the process and has since kept the requirements at three to four main documents only. So just very quickly, if you are a government bank, it's just the three documents, the letter of the local chief executive detailing the, the purpose, the terms, and uh, uh, the conditions. Second is the certification of the treasurer, if there is any loan. And third is a certification from COA as to uh, findings and financial statements. Now, if you are a private bank, just a certification that uh, it will not require uh, deposits as a compensating balance. So since then, we have streamlined the process right now. We are uh, issuing our certificates electronically. Uh, we have a 20-day period turn around uh, commitment time to uh, local governments as long as the documents are complete. And we have kept our ISA certification that our process is aligned with a uh, quality management system. Yes. So thank you for, for all that uh, that's, uh, information, Edi Nino. No? Just a very quick follow-up. Since the, those reforms were instituted in 2016, the simplified procedure, have you seen uh, uh, an uh, uh, increase in local government borrowing, successful uh, local yeah. government borrowing? Yeah, I think the interest has uh, grown substantially. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, information campaign, webinars to uh, introduce to the local governments how, uh, how credit financing could support their very good uh, programs and uh, priority projects. So just to give you a, uh, a picture of the appetite of the LGUs, last year, we issued uh, certificates to around uh, 254 local government uh, units and uh, they had around an aggregate loan requirement of 81 billion pesos. That's what they needed. But the, the, but the limit that we certified uh, was 202 billion. So uh, I think over time, uh, considering also uh, the recovery uh, efforts for uh, COVID-19, we recognize that local governments could, should consider uh, credit financing so that they don't have to sacrifice the need to tap right now their um, capex for uh, not capex their uh, increased operating expenses but at the same time they will not sacrifice the priority uh, investments that can actually be financed by uh, credit financing okay uh, again that's that's uh, useful and important information for our lgu partners no? so not only is funding available uh, there are support measures in place and also streamlined procedures to help them access uh, uh, credit financing. Let's, let's look at this problem at, uh, uh, in a slightly different angle now, because I remember you said, uh, Wimpy Fentabellum, not, not everything has to be uh, via PPP joint venture. So maybe if, if we can ask uh, Ms. Beth Coronel, no, who's a senior first vice president, uh, and head of uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, banking at uh, RCBC. Uh, Ms. Beth, have you seen, because another way to look at this is for banks, for LGUs to partner with private sector companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The panel right before us, I think is a good example of ESCOs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, LGU doesn't really have to form a joint venture. They can just go through a normal procurement process and hire an ESCO. Uh, and that has the benefit of an ESCO providing support to multiple LGUs. Uh, we heard a while ago now from, from the League of Barangays that for the barangay level, sometimes it's difficult to obtain financing, no? but maybe somewhere they partner with an, an, an ESCO, they can, they can benefit from a lower uh, cost uh, of, of uh, electricity through this mechanism. Have you seen private companies uh, making uh, offering this kind of service uh, to LGUs, and, and is this something that RCBC is is actively supporting? Um, thank you for that, Commissioner F. No, if I may just start by saying that um, LGUs are really major enablers in the proliferation of RE and EE projects in their localities, as emphasized earlier by Ato Attorney Mona. We see that in all the private sector. Uh, projects that we funded. And this is especially true at the period of uh, project inception, where private proponents will need to secure the necessary permits, approvals, and the like. And when these projects are easily given permits, then 
they can proceed with the construction of the project as well as securing the needed financing from the banks like us. Now, um, to answer your question, Commissioner F, uh, it's not impossible to structure a solution in partnership with the private sector. One example, just I'll just give one quick example that comes to mind is like how banks may be able to finance, let's say, a portfolio of RE or EE projects by a private sector proponent who will enter into agreements with various LGUs. So top of mind, for example, would be solar. Um, a private entity can put up, let's say, solar panels on LGU-owned properties uh, that can be rooftops or idle land. And depending on the structure, the LGU can realize savings from their electricity bill or uh, additional income, and at the same time, credit that project towards its green and sustainability initiatives. So in that case, it's really, it's like a tripartite thing between the, amongst the LGU, the private sector proponent, and the banks. Um, alternatively, the LGUs can also identify areas which are best suitable for the, for the RE projects. This is consistent with what uh, Yusa Quimpy mentioned earlier for LGUs to do site prep or maybe site identification. So LGUs may have constituents man, who are willing to put up the project and the private banks like RCBC may fund such projects based on mutually acceptable terms. So there is always a way to structure it uh, to arrive at that, uh, at that particular end. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for that, Ms. Beth. No? So there are, there are solutions uh, that can address this concern. Let's now go to the other extreme, the more complex extreme, uh, and the part that really interests me because I work for the Securities and Exchange Commission. So let, let, let's talk to um, Mr. Graham uh, uh, Fitzgerald, who's the country head of HSBC. Graham, I, I, I know from our own discussions, uh, you know that there's a lot of interest actually about developing a municipal bond market uh, here in the Philippines as, as one of those credit mechanisms for LGUs to raise funds uh, to fund capital investments. You know, HSBC does a lot of business worldwide and you've experienced, uh, you have this experience um, in, in helping other local governments uh, 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 tap uh, the capital markets. Is there anything you can share with, with our listeners uh, on, on uh, how, how we can have municipal bonds here in the Philippines or do you have a model or a template or, or some uh, something that we can look at uh, as guidance? Yeah, um, Commissioner F, uh, look, great question. And uh, I'm also very mindful uh, of the time and um, and I probably stand between people in the dinners. So um, I'll just I'll just give you a few quick points. Um, firstly, delighted to be here and, and thanks to the UK Embassy for, for arranging this. Um, when we look at some of the municipality um, type structures, I guess we're talking about sub sovereigns. So we're we're talking about you know cities, municipalities and regions. And I think the growth in sort of municipalities or sub sovereigns coming to the market is, is well established and continuing to grow. Um, we, we sort of look at this as being driven by what we'd sort of call future cities. And, you know, for us, that's sort of talking about, you know, I think you put a number to it by 2050, something like 65% of the world's population will have been urbanized, moved into cities. And you know, that's something we're seeing here in the Philippines. You know, in fact, if you look at the growth rates of urbanization globally, it's, it's largely driven by Africa and Asia. So very much impacting us here. Um, so this future city works about looking at growth and livability in cities and how to how do they, they are amenities, how do they reduce carbon emissions, improve air quality. So, you know, we've been talking you know, and sharing a lot of ideas with the likes of Department of Finance, um, NEDA, BCDA, on the range of cities we work with around the world, you know, you know like New York, Singapore, Cairo, um, any of those sort of cities on, on how do they do that transition and with, you know, accessing the bond market, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, the, 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 that sort of green financing, the bonds is very much at the heart of what a lot of them look around but it, it's not just about the bond uh, or the, the the capital market it's also i think around the the ecosystem around it you know for example the supply chain finance so if you need sustainability supply chain finance you know for example for the lgus if their construction companies won the contract for a, for a, a project you know how they will also need some financing through that process and the the buyers and the suppliers follow a sustainability model so i think that's equally as important but 
bond market well established um you know some one of the ones which i think is i think is also sort of touches on some of the other speakers have spoken about earlier um you know in fact just uh, last month and, and whilst it's not a a city i think what it does represent is a, an interesting point um you know we did the the world's first sovereign sustainability so cook so a sharia compliant bond you know the level of interest of that and that was in malaysia the level of interest was just phenomenal it was something like six times oversubscribed you know 90 percent of the the take up was by international investors you know a lot of fund asset managed insurance companies so what it shows is a huge amount of interest in these types of investments and not just here in the philippines but internationally as well right thanks for that game so uh, before we go into the Q&A, so lots of funding options available, lots of proof of concept on the ground, lots of possible future funding uh, opportunities. So uh, with that, you know, I, I'd like to close the panel discussion uh, and then turn it over to Asik Paula uh, Alvarez to see if there are any questions uh, from the participants for the panel, for Russell or, or for myself. So Asik Paula, over to you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Amatong, for that very insightful panel discussions. And now we'll have the Q&A, and I will include you as one of the people who will answer. So for our first question, uh, this is open to anyone. Uh, does the certification process for LGUs apply to entering into contingent liabilities as well as direct borrowings? Maybe this could be for... Um, BLGF, Director Nino, and then we could have insights from the other panelists as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Asik Paula. Um, for borrowings of local governments that will go through the monetary board uh, approval, uh, it will require our uh, certification process. So that includes direct borrowings, uh, even bonds, and because we have to determine whether uh, the debt servicing uh, limit and the borrowing capacity uh, uh, is um, or their loan requirement is within the limits that we will certify. Yeah, Nino, I, I think the question there is so what if they enter into a PPP? So, uh, you know, the, there's no theoretically no cost to the LGU, but uh, there could be a potential contingent liability if the PPP provider doesn't actually build uh, whatever it is that he was supposed to deliver. Is that also covered by? Um, by the BLGF uh, uh, procedure? Uh, right now, no. So um, it's really uh, good to track also the uh, contingent liabilities of uh, uh, local government uh, units. Commissioner Amatong? Yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead, JD. So for PPP projects, um, uh, exposure to contingent liabilities is really more, uh, uh, have to ha is being, is being and have to be monitored. And in potential PPP projects up for approval, including local government units using the BOT law, contingent liabilities and exposure to the same would generally form part of the project terms that needs to be approved by the proper approving body depending on the legal framework. So say for example, in the BOT law, there are cost thresholds for the project. So it may go up to the Sangunian or to the local to the ICC, depending on the cost thresholds. So exposure to CL and the amount of the estimation of the same will generally forms part of the project terms that has to be approved as well. Thanks, Director JD. Back to you, Asik Paula, if there are other questions from uh, the audience. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Matong. And this next question, uh, it's supposed to be for the BSP, but I don't think they have a representative. So I'll just ask the floor and see if maybe PPP or Commissioner Amatong or Alvin wants to answer. So with regards to PPP lending, is there a move to extend the single borrower's limit allowance for banks to finance PPP projects? So previous BSP policy covering this already expired in 2016. Maybe Miss Beth, you, you might know as a regular tea of, uh, of the... actually. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Actually, Commissioner F, that could have been very well my question as well because I would like to know also if that the um the usual suspects who enter into PPPs, especially the big ones, uh, it will need it will actually need a little more help as far as limits are concerned and and um. 
that reprieve on the single borrower's limit will be, I'm sure, will be welcomed by the banks in order to drive more uh, PPP projects. But no, no signal yet from... Uh, no the... signal, no signal yet. I have not heard as of now, yeah. Commissioner, um, in we based on our monitoring in 2018, uh, the BSP issued circulars relating to a separate a limit for projects under the build 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 program, and in the twenty in 2020 last year, uh, in in light of the uh, pandemic, there was also a circular issued on uh, an increase in the limit in relation to econ economic recovery. Uh, for the pandemic. So me, those are my two insights on this that maybe our colleagues from the BSP can further elaborate on this in, uh, uh, in some other forum or in some other opportunity. But yeah, in 2018, there was one for the Build, Build, Build program and in 20, last year for uh, economic recovery. From, from, from the COVID pandemic. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions, Asik Paula? Yes, uh, last question. So for financing of renewable energy projects, are banks willing to finance these from pre-development wherein no power supply agreement is available yet? So, so maybe Ms. Beth and then Graham, if, uh, if you're willing to finance those in pre-development, RE projects at the pre-development stage where no agreement is available. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the typical financing scheme for uh, renewable projects is via, via project finance. No? We use a project finance structure. And with that, the banks really look at the offtake agreement. So that's very important to the banks. So if, it, if we use a project finance structure, then definitely we will really need an offtake because banks shy away from merchant risk. But I'm not saying that, that that's going to be... Um, Final meaning uh, later on as the markets mature, uh, banks will be more open to that. But at the in the meantime, uh, market risk is something that the banks most banks are not prepared to take. But having said that, um, there are also different ways to structure. So it it's possible that we don't do it on a project finance uh, route. We can do it by a, by a, the usual corporate finance route, where where you really base your your evaluation and the strength of the sponsors. Um, but um, again, there can be ways to structure it. But if it's a typical project finance structure, it really needs to have a PSA in place. Yeah, I, I have very little to add to what Beth said. I mean, it really does depend on the nature of the project, the viability of the project, the reports, and, and the repayment source, the offtake. So um, th that's going to be key for any, any project. My recommendation is talk to your banking partners and, and show them what you're thinking about and see what they think. And, and if they can't help you, go, go talk to one of the specialist advisory firms on it. Okay. Um, any any further questions from from the audience, Asik Paula? No more from the audience, unless you have any other inputs, Commissioner Amatong, before we end the panel. I, I just wanted to give Russell an opportunity because uh, he 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 did a great start to the panel, uh, but there were no questions for him. Russell, a, any final thoughts uh, after what you've heard from the panel and the questions coming from the audience? And I think only to, to I think add to what everyone else has been saying, which is there's obviously lots of interest in financing low carbon energy projects, and there's lots of interest in developing low carbon energy projects um, across the Philippines, including with LGUs. And I think the challenge is how do we connect up those pieces? And clearly, there's people on this call, not just in our session, but throughout the afternoon, who are happy to try and help connect, make some of those connections and if it's helping LGUs understand how they can access some of the instruments that are available again you've heard several times I think there are organizations and people who are willing to provide some of that some of that assistance but hopefully this isn't the last conversation we're having around this this is the first conversation and certainly on our side in terms of the UK government and the low carbon energy program more than happy to you know determine and work out how we can provide some support to LGUs who are looking to try and access some of the sustainable finance instruments that, that we've talked about uh, this afternoon. So maybe we can take that as an offer to ULA that uh, maybe if they want to do a, a follow on or maybe one of the organizations like the League of Provinces, the Mayor's League, Councillor's League, 
you might want to uh, you might want to have a follow up to this. Uh, with that, I'd like to close the panel. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists, to Russell as the the scene setting uh, 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 presenter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Asit Fall. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Amatong, and thank you for everyone who stayed up until uh, this hour. You know, we are running uh, very late, but before we officially close the forum, may we ask everyone to turn on their cameras. Uh, the British Embassy wants to have a family photo. <laughs> so, Kat, please let us know. Hi, Asakola. So, uh... Uh, so I hope everyone uh, is now ready and um, please uh, open your camera. Okay, so one, two, three. Okay, another one. One, two, three, smile. <laughs> another one. One, two, three, smile. Okay, one last. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Uh, we've come to the end of our fourth panel, and I hope all the participants find the discussions useful and enriching. So, may we now call on Kat Cobalias from the British Embassy Manila to share to us the next steps. Maybe you want to offer our LGU's assistance or where they can uh, seek uh, guidance for further assistance. Kat? Thanks for that, Asikwala. But for that one, the one that you mentioned uh, about the possible next steps, uh, I mean, way forward, I think my deputy head of mission will be, uh, can provide us that direction later during his closing message. Again, thank you, Asik, and thank you to our uh, panelists as well for sharing their expertise and for the insightful discussions that we had uh, this afternoon. Definitely, uh, this conversation indeed emphasized the role of our local government units in terms of achieving the low carbon or the clean energy scenario, which was emphasized to us by uh, USEC WMP this afternoon. So some key takeaways uh, from this session. Uh, first, policies are in place that govern promotion and adoption of renewable energy sources, uh, as well as energy efficiency standards. And just to cite a few, these are mentioned a while ago by uh, Yusek Wempi and uh, Director Patrick. We have the RE Act, we have the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, we have the EVOS, we have uh, the Joint Memorandum Circular between the DILG and the DOE. And if these uh, policies were just properly implemented, this will really lead uh, to long-term benefits. And as our speaker from Thomas Lloyd emphasized, and also that USEC WMP, the Philippines is really blessed with natural resources, with renewable energy resources, which they call a big show as, uh, as our DOE colleagues calls it. And then second, it's good to highlight that once the RE and EE potential are unlocked, it will definitely boost local economy through revenue generation, cost savings, increase resilience, generate local employment, and there will also be health and environment benefits that will be provided to the local community. And as mentioned by Sarah and Director Patrick Aquino a while ago, uh, the evidence is not just internationally, but there are also evidence here in the country. And then finally, uh, there are financing facilities, instruments, and products that are available to local government units. We heard from uh, PPP Center, BLGF, RCPC, Standard Chartered, HSBC, TBP, and ABP. Uh, AD, ADB, some of those instruments and facilities which are open to our LGUs. And we hope that the LGU will be successful to access those financial instruments. And just uh, for the next step uh, to this uh, workshop or webinar that we have this afternoon, as earlier mentioned to us by Ambassador Cruz, our team will be uh, collating all the discussions that we had in this forum. And then this will feed into the discussion in the Energy Transition Council, the national process, and then uh, particularly to the uh, national dialogue that will take place in June. Also, this is very useful because uh, in future webinars, we would want to design a very strategic and specific uh, training design for our local government. So 
the information that we're provided here will be used to uh, make sure that we'll do that in the future in future webinars. So again, uh, thank you everyone for your active participation. Over to you, Asek. Thank you, Kat, for summarizing all of our discussion points. And to officially close our event, may we now call on Deputy Head of Mission, Alastair Totti of the British Embassy of Manila to deliver our closing remarks. Deputy. Yes, thank Paula. Good to see you. Uh, Commissioner Amaton, Graham, Russell, sorry I missed your presentation the tail end of it looked very impressive. I'm having real uh, backdrop envy with uh, Kat. I need to, as you see, work on my backdrop and not as impressive as Kat. So I'm sorry to be joining you so late on today's forum. Um, but as you know, and as I'm sure uh, Danny made clear earlier, the British government is always uh, honoured to join our partners on the sustainable development agenda through dialogue and consultation, as you've been doing this afternoon. And I hope this event has helped everyone to gain a deeper understanding of the perspectives from all stakeholders in the energy network, and also provided a wealth of possibilities to take forward the Philippines energy transition programmes. Allow me to just briefly share some thoughts so you can all uh, go ahead and get your dinner, as Graham said. First, as the science shows, there's an urgent need for climate action to shape a greener and cleaner future as countries recover from the pandemic. So we need to address the challenges and turn them into opportunities and reap the benefits from choosing a greener and cleaner, more sustainable energy pathway. And we can do this through the integration of renewable energy and efficiency targets in national and local planning. Second, today's sessions doubtless show that the conditions for an energy transition already exist and are available. Relevant laws and policies are already in place, notably the Renewable Energy Act, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, the Local Government Code, as well as DOE's coal moratorium and the Central Bank's Sustainable Finance Framework. Investor appetite for green and sustainable projects is strong and waiting to unlock opportunities. And there are also innovative financing instruments that are ready to be utilised for green investments. Harmonizing all these tools and mechanisms into a cohesive decarbonization strategy and implementation framework will help to meet national emission targets. Third, and lastly, each key energy stakeholder is part of a wider ecosystem. Each one has a key role to play. All your perspectives are important in crafting the most appropriate national solutions and energy transition strategies. But effective planning does not happen in a vacuum. A national dialogue is necessary to ensure urgent discussions among government, private sector, experts and donors to elicit innovativity. I'm sure that our strength and partnerships, collaboration and these conversations will thrive and continue. the SEC, the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines, and I'd also like to thank our speakers, moderators and panelists for their fantastic participation and feedback and honest views. Thank you all for making this forum a success. Maraming Salama. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Head of Mission Alastair Totti, and thank you to all the speakers and participants of this forum. And on behalf of the DOF and our partners, the British Embassy Manila, the Department of Energy, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Securities and Exchange Commission, and ULAP, we are grateful for your time and participation. And again, we want to stress that climate change is a real threat and it needs a whole of government approach. And this means not only the national government, but more importantly, the local government as well. So we will fight this challenge together and hand in hand. So we hope everyone had an enriching discussion and uh, we look forward to our next meetings. And um, we hope everyone has a good dinner. Stay safe and good evening. So this ends our forum. And again, thank you very much.